I would like to first of all express my sincere gratitude to Your Excellency Audrey Tang for giving us uh, the opportunity to pick your wisdom and exchange ideas on digital governance. Um, my appreciation also goes to Ajahn Titirat uh, Thip Samrit Kun from the Faculty of Law, Thammasat University. Uh, she will moderate the session for us uh, uh, this afternoon. I would like to thank also Institute of East Asian Study, Thammasat University, uh, Taiwan Economic and Cultural Office uh, in Bangkok, and Taiwan Asia, Ex Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation for your efforts and support that makes this uh, event happen. Um, before we start uh, today's events, I would like to reiterate that uh, today's session will be a Q&A style. I give the liberty to the moderator and our guest um, um, honor speaker on how you uh, will run the session. Um, we uh, uh, we send our uh, some questions to uh, the minister teams already, um, but feel free to ask the question when we open the floor for you. Um, you can uh, turn on the microphone and ask the question, or you can type in the chat box. I, I, am, I, I am sure that the moderator will be happy to facilitate uh, your, your questions. Um, uh, with the minister uh, reputation um, and her success in, in uh, maximizing um, digital technology in addressing the COVID-19, uh, she actually, she needs no introduction, but uh, I would like to remind all of you that um, she is among the youngest cabinet member in Taiwan, and she also uh, very active in the social transformation activity and the promotion of uh, radical transparency for decades. So today we are very lucky and honored, and it is my pleasure to have um, uh, Your Excellency with us. Um, so without further ado, I would like to stop and pass the floor to Ajahn Tidirat and uh, Your Excellency. Um, Ajahn Tidirat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ka Ajahn Somkir. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, <laughs> everyone. I'm very pleased to meet you again, Minister. Uh, so my name is Titirat. I'm from Faculty of Law, Thammasat University. So I'll be your moderator uh, today. And uh, well, I would like to welcome all the uh, participants uh, today as well. And as Ajahn Somkir said, uh, our uh, style would be uh, talk, uh, I, I will, uh, we would like it to be more like casual talk uh, and exchange of ideas, exchange of knowledge that we can uh, 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 do in this three hours. So let me uh, uh, suggest uh, the, the, the flow of our talk today. So um, we received some questions uh, from uh, in advance from the, the participants. I hope you already uh, received that list is that uh, uh the case uh, minister yeah uh, sh should i just start like pasting it uh or how should we proceed okay so i i think uh the 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 questions they are uh um, there are some similarities in those questions as well, mm -hmm. and I saw that those question uh, some concerns about uh, the tech vision uh, or the history of innovation in Taiwan, and also some concerns about the new technology, metaverse, cryptocurrency, many exciting things, and some also uh, focus on how we can apply the technology or innovation to solve social issues, uh, and then um, some also ask about leadership, which I believe it will be. The the topic that you can uh, contribute very, very well, and also about the digital education or the problem of digital DIY. So um, uh, what do you think, uh, Minister, which one you would like to, which topic you would like to go first? I mean, it's fine. Usually uh, we, we work with the, the Slido application so people can vote uh, on the questions they want to uh, hear answered. But that's usually what we use uh, uh, when the time is limited and there's no mm -hmm. time to go through all the questions. But since this time around, we've got more than two hours, actually, uh, almost three hours. So uh, I, I believe we should give each version like no question uh, left behind, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, why, why don't we just, just follow things sequentially and um, people also feel free to uh, raise your hand and ask follow-up questions and so on. Would that be okay with Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think, uh, let me just try to 
it's also some get car could you please try to meet uh some uh participant oh thank you very much mm -hmm. thank you very much okay. sorry for for uh, we know that this might happen in there sure, of course <laughs> of, it's of like the weather day. yeah sometimes it rains yeah right yeah I like your I like your analogy so much. Yeah, if you think like it's a weather, then we don't have to be frustrated about that wait, wait, wait. that much, right? That's right. Yes. Okay, so uh, maybe we can go uh, uh, by mm -hmm. by the the the, uh, the sequence of of mm -hmm. the uh, question, mm -hmm. and maybe I think I I will try to uh, pull some uh, relevant question that might have some okay. similarities. Yeah, ju just let me about. know of the number, and I'll I'll uh, string them together, so to speak. Very nice, very nice. I might, I think I might start with uh, some like the, the vision on technology so that we can see the, the big picture first. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the organizer told me that we can have a, a break. We are allowed to have a break <laughs> during the session. Would it be all right if we have a break? Uh, uh, in mode. Yeah, sure. yeah, of course. Uh, just, just let me know when you would like to have a break and I'll just finish up that question and maybe we take a 10 minutes break. Okay, thank you. Oh, you can also tell me. Uh -huh. I'm fine. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm very used to three hour sessions. So I'm okay. Very, very, very energetic. I know of that as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then, yeah, uh, we can uh, start. Uh, and for the for the audience, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, uh, give your opinion or your feedback. Uh, both in the chat box or also uh, by uh, raising your hands as well. But I think we will focus. Uh, we will uh, focus more on like raising hands or have direct interaction more in the second half, right? It's so yet. So that right. might be good. But if you really need, do you feel like um, uh, it is better to to speak up about that right now? Uh, feel free to raise your hands. And for those who feel more comfortable with uh, speaking Thai or typing in Thai, uh, feel free to do so. I will uh, uh, try to facilitate or translate or summarize your question over there. Um, okay so if it's all set about how we're gonna uh manage this session i think we can start from uh the very first topic about like tech vision okay so maybe i think we can uh can we start uh from um the very uh question on the, the the second and and third question i think these two questions they are, are linked to each other right mm -hmm. so the one question uh would you please share your vision or your dream of digital governance in the next 10 or 20 years and the third question is asking about like what is the key success factors in in taiwan's policy innovation i think this one is not only about digital innovation it can be also mm -hmm. about the other uh innovations as well yeah. So could you please uh, tell us about this? Definitely. Uh, so WebEx is telling me that my uh, connection quality is not good, but I hear you perfectly. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly uh, okay. as well. So, so maybe, maybe it's not as bad as it says. Uh, okay, so thank you for the great questions. Um, I, I believe that it's the time to kind of share my uh, job description uh, as the beginning uh, of this talk, because when I became digital minister in 2016, I was asked this very question about the vision of digital governance uh, in the next 10 or 20 years. And so I wrote a poem, uh, indeed a prayer uh, about it. So I'll just share it now. It goes like this. Uh, when we see the internet of things, let's make it an internet of beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that a singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. So that's literally my job description. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I, I believe um, the, the common thread here uh, is very simple, is that while IT, information technology, connects machines with machines, digital um, is about connecting people to people. 
it's about employing IT technology to connect people to people, but it always should play a assistive role and never a authoritarian dominating role. My favorite example of uh, assistive technology is uh, what well, is eyeglass. Many of you were wearing similar <laughs> assistive technologies, I'm sure. Uh, I, I saw it uh, when we turned uh, on the camera. Um, the thing of this eyeglass is that it's 100% aligned to my best interest, right? It helps me to see you better, but it doesn't say, oh, uh, I want to replace your eyes. I want to push uh, uh, the advertisement for 10 seconds and you can't uh, close them until uh, you watch them. You're not allowed to see other things, in which case, of course, it will be uh, aligned to some other people's interests, not my interests. But because it's empowering just to me, it's a personal assistive technology. It's also quite accountable in the sense that if there is bias, like if it's blurry or it's uh, some malfunctioning, I can fix it myself uh, or I can bring it to the repair person down the street, they can fix it. And we don't have to pay tens of millions of dollars uh, in licensing fees. We don't have to uh, reverse engineer the black box uh, with 10 months of hacking or something. We know exactly how it works because the schemata of what uh, makes AI class work is public uh, open access knowledge. So because of this, uh, I believe all the digital technologies we design must bear this alignment and accountability in mind and assist people bringing tech to where the people are instead of asking people to adapt to technology. So that's my vision. Uh, and now uh, the key success factors of implementing this is uh, instead of working for the people, we work with the people. We ensure that uh, the iterations, meaning the time it takes uh, between, uh, we have an important thing to let the entire society know. For example, in 2020, three quarter or more of people need to wear a mask and wash their hands. Or last year, contact tracing need to work not 24 hours after each infected case, but 24 minutes. Or uh, we need to get uh, more than 80% of our population vaccinated and so on. So these are, of course, important things, but it's not digital in nature, but digital does help uh, by translating these messages into memes, into funny, um, um, pieces of information that people would remix to increase its basic transmission rate, uh, that is to say, go viral. Uh, and so we make sure that when people um, listen to every day at 2 p.m. our press conference, they can call this toll-free number 1922 and ask to their heart's content uh, whatever they want to report uh, or think about with the latest counter-epidemic uh, strategies. Uh, and then on the very next 2 p.m press conference, not only do we answer all the journalists' questions, but all the previous suggestions from the previous 24 hours uh, are given the uh, stage, are given the um, floor. So that, for example, um, in 2020 April, there was a young boy that called 1922 saying, oh, you're rationing our mask, which is great, but all I got was pink mask, which is not great. All the boys in my class have navy blue mask. I don't want to wear pink to school. Do something about it. And then the very next day at 2 p.m., all the medical officers wore pink. Uh, Minister Chen uh, even said, our commander even said, that Pink Panther was his childhood hero. So the boy became the most hit boy in the class for only he has the color that the heroes wear, and heroes hero wear, and all the brands, all the advertisers and so on in Taiwan just turn their avatars pink in the social media. And, and so that's the power of virality, of communicating important ideas, of wearing a mask not just for, to protect others, uh, but to express yourself uh, to uh, the people of all different ages and so on. So that's what digital can do uh, to amplify good ideas. And also as important is that whenever there are new innovations that can, for example, visualize uh, the real-time image of uh, mask in pharmacies to help pre-ordering the mask, to uh, make sure that vaccinations are booked uh, in an orderly and fair manner, or to, for example, enable contact tracing in Taiwan. Uh, everyone, when entering a public venue, just use their mobile phone uh, without needing to download any app. Uh, just point your built-in camera to the QR code, and it sends the toll-free SMS, again, to 1922, and just present. So that's like literally three seconds. 
uh, and then it finishes a check-in <coughs> that uh, enabled contact tracing to work automatically, exposure notifications to work automatically without compromising privacy. And all these, like mass rationing map, the contact tracing system, were not invented by the government. It's by individual civic technologists uh, that look at the KPIs uh, that's important to the society and then determining better ways to, to make that happen. And then we say, yeah, we do a reverse procurement. Instead of paying their money to build things, uh, they uh, make sure that the government need to implement like a IT vendor, the real-time API that's needed to make that happen. It works better than procurement because in procurement, usually you are allowed to change the specific only once a quarter or something. But using reverse procurement, more than 100 different teams are working on the same thing together. So better solution that works better for certain populations or certain uh, municipalities uh, gets developed in a grassroots manner. And then we can adapt the algorithms and APIs in real time, not bounded by the contracts of traditional procurement. So that's the second thing is to amplify grassroots social innovations. So so the communication side and the innovation side work hand in hand. And the uh, uh, way we work is just by shortening the iteration between a good idea and the idea of getting implemented. Wow, I think the, the your your examples was uh, were fascinating. Was the the mass, the pink mass, and also uh, the idea of having uh, civic tech. Uh, uh, I said to people to propose the, the better solution. Uh, may I add a following uh, follow up question on this issue? Because it, uh, um, for in in Thailand, I think we do have this pro, uh, this also uh, this solution that coming from grassroots or from people who see problem and would like to contribute to solve this problem, especially during COVID nineteen, uh, when we see a lot of um, uh, uh, problem with the accessibility to medical centers or to uh, the vaccination uh, booking or even with the checkup, right? And and then, but the, the problem is that once the, the grassroots or the civic tech propose something mm -hmm. and it's quite hard to implement that or uh, how does it plug in with the existing governmental system. And it doesn't mean that the governmental agency do not want the new solution. Sometimes they want it, but there were some um, barrier or some kind of like very hard to to plug them together is there any uh, suggestion from from you on on that side how it is it seems like everything goes very well and the government uh welcome the the solutions from the citizen side how how did you make it happen yeah uh this is a great question now, uh, when I became digital minister in 2016, one of the first things that we did is to maximize modularity by writing in our procurement contract that all the uh, vendors that implement IT systems that's visible to human users must also make it visible to machine users uh, using the Linux Foundation standard open API, usually in JSON format. Uh, and uh, the language of that clause, I'm sure you have a similar clause uh, was uh, piggybacking on the accessibility clause. Uh, previously in Taiwan, if an IT vendor builds a website and say it's just for people who can see, but for people who see dif uh, with difficulty, uh, we're not providing the service, then that vendor could be disqualified for discriminating against people with seeing difficulties uh, for not conforming to accessibility standards. Uh, so we're essentially saying a machine are a kind of people too. Uh, and if you discriminate <laughs> against machines, uh, then you could also be disqualified uh, from future procurement. Or if you say, I have to charge you four times more in order to build a API endpoint, you could also be disqualified uh, for future procurements. And what a change it, it makes, because uh, in Taiwan, when we build large IT systems, uh, sometimes it's a result of citizens' petitions. In 2017, there was someone who petitioned our national uh, e-petition system joint system saying, uh, our tax filing experience is is explosively hostile, end of quote. <laughs> and they got quite a few people resonating with them. Uh, and then we simply say, okay, let's just collaboratively redesign uh, the new experience uh, using web-based technologies and open API. And so people who complain suddenly turned into co-creators. But uh, because mm -hmm. we have participation officers, staff in each ministry uh, in charge of engaging the public, we made sure that when we hold workshops such as this, uh, we hold uh, 
one every two weeks. So when we hold workshops such as this, um, the facilitator in each breakout groups are public servants unrelated to the issue. So when we redesign the text filing experience, how the API should look like, how the experience should look like, might be facilitated by the Coastal Guard, by the Ocean Affairs Council's participation officer. But when we design the opening up ocean policy and its related uh, web systems, then maybe it's facilitated by the finance ministry or the tax agency's participation officer. And the reason why is very simple. I'm sure you can all relate to this, right? Because when you're off work, you're also a citizen. <laughs> the Coastal Guard also files their own tax, right? Uh, and the uh, tax agency person also likes to surf or fish in an amateur fraction or whatever. So when the citizens uh, enter the workshop and they see their breakout groups are facilitated by public servants, usually there's some distance, but in a few seconds they discover, oh, this public servant is definitely on my side. <laughs> they don't defend uh, government policy. They actually make demands in a much more professional manner than I could. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm very uh, relaxed and uh, feel that it's authentic that I'm interfacing with another fellow citizen, uh, not a, a public servant defending existing policy. So when we redesign this, all the different agencies learn about this text filing system. And then later on, when we need to reuse the authentication part, for example, to uh, make sure the ration mask uh, do not uh, receive double booking and so on, we reuse the text filing system. And then when the Economic Affairs Ministry uh, want to issue the stimulus uh, coupon vouchers, they then reuse another part of the system, and so on and so on. So because it's built like Lego blocks, uh, the IT vendor already uh, have the pot potential uh, to interface with dif different front ends while keeping the back end secure and tested. So if your foundational system like tax filing service are all procured this way, then you already have a lot of safe uh, and pr privacy preserving uh, API endpoints that when new needs arise, like uh, contact tracing, printing QR code, vaccination reservation, um, or credentials for vaccination, and so on. You just kind of plug and play different front ends from the grassroots, from the civil tech sector to the well-proven bedrock APIs. I see. Wow. So it seems like we, uh, we, you, you did uh, provide a uh, structure that will welcome uh, uh, more change or will be very agile or very flexible for the uh, pl the new plugs in. But at the same time, also your answer focus on the human centric culture as well. And I, I really, impre I'm really impressed about the way that uh, to 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 uh, change the hat of uh, public officials that actually they are also citizens mm -hmm. and, and try to, to make citizens realize that, okay, we are on the same page, we are on the same side, working for the same purpose. Wow, that's, that's really fascinating. Linking to that, I think I would like to move to question uh, number uh, 24, mm -hmm. which uh, is talk about the barrier, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the something that might block the transformation. I think this linked to the, the, the issue that we talked uh, before. And also like uh, to the, I, I'm very impressed about uh, the uh, vision that you present at the beginning, how human-centric it could be. And also it is very poetic as well. But um, I mean, people might be able to see this vision, but uh, it might, I might, there might also be something to block this as well, right? So you answered about the, the technological structure, about the human-centric culture. Is there any, any other things that we should be aware or we should be careful of that might block the transformation? Yes, definitely. So our theory of change in my office is that I'm a public servant to the public service, meaning that my mm -hmm. primary customer are other public servants. Because it's very easy if you design things in a top-down manner that looks like time-saving for citizens. They save an hour. But actually, a public official will have to spend two hours just to save that one hour for the citizen. It's very easy to design that, uh, especially in a democratic uh, polity, because uh, one are beholding right to the parliamentarians. And when they demand something, it's very easy to say, ah, yeah, let's just work over time uh, to deliver what the MPs want. Uh, but, but that's not sustainable, right? If you keep overworking yourself, the quality of service suffers. Uh, and so I always make it very clear to MPs and other uh, citizen representatives saying, you know, what we are looking at are what we call Pareto improvements that are incremental, Pareto improvements, meaning that everyone involved, all the stakeholders need to not spend 
extra time and effort. It need to be a time mm -hmm. saver, or at least not wasting time for everyone. And at the same time, it need to make everyone feel safe, or at least as safe as before. It must not introduce additional risk. So this is what I call mm -hmm. swift and safe. It must be swift and safe for everyone. Uh, too many uh, digital transformation fail because uh, the uh, transformation officer uh, took those two things and think they're fungible. Like everybody can work a little bit extra over time to harden the cybersecurity and feel safer. Or we can relax a little bit of the safety constraints uh, to save some time. Uh, but uh, before long, uh, any delta, any comparison with the status quo uh, will be perceived as weakness of the system and will create division and polarization because people would say, oh, we are uh, the ones that gets left behind or sacrificed or things like that. And that will cause the legitimacy of the system go down very quickly but by saying oh actually we consulted with all the stakeholders they think they're all uh, sweet and safe uh, or at least not um, you know worse than before uh, and then we can then say yeah this is a good way to go forward and nobody will then block the path to transformation so that means for example when I show you the QR code based SMS based scanning we, we didn't say for a second they replace paper you can still write your name uh, and contact number or even stamp your way in. What we're saying is that uh, when you're writing down the numbers, a lot of people gather in the same place, which is unsafe uh, health-wise last year. Uh, people may be sharing the same pen and things like that, or the venue. Uh, they may uh, be uh, unable to process that many paper. So if we post a few QR codes there and people who uh, opt in uh, to the QR code scanning just go ahead and do that, it also protects the people who prefer to use paper. And that's why we got massive adoption, more than 2 uh, million venues joining voluntarily in the first three days. Uh, but if we say this replaces paper, we would get nowhere. Ah, I see. So it's really like a, a user centric and actually human centric to use your words, mm -hmm. Thank right? You. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I really like that uh, the the idea of the web and 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 self uh, transformation for everyone, not only for the citizen but also for the workers as well. And and then yeah, that's that's really yeah uh, a very brilliant. And I think this one is addressing the pain point of many policy implementation in Thailand as well. Uh, following, following up that issue, uh, there is one question, it's question number 28, uh, about uh, the, the seniority, seniority culture. I think this also linked to how um, technology can be adopted, and this might be another uh, issue another mm -hmm. element that might block the transformation that people think it might block the transformation mm -hmm. is this true that a uh, uh, seniority culture might block the transformation or block the innovation or is it just a myth or is it any way that we can overcome uh, this seniority culture mm -hmm. that, that's a great question um, in taiwan uh, we think that senior people are full of wisdom uh, they have the key uh, to make things happen, the personal connections, the resources, and so on, which I understand uh, shares uh, with the Thai uh, culture as well. Um, however, the young people, the digital natives, uh, they have a f firmer grasp on emerging uh, technologies, on emerging trends. They are better at thinking out of the box, especially because they consider their neighbors, not people who live physically nearby, but uh, mm -hmm. kind of value system nearby, right? Sharing the same hashtags <laughs> on, on social media. <laughs> so, so they have a different tribe, a different community, uh, neighborhood. Uh, they have a neighborhood of the globe, uh, so to speak. Uh, so, so in Taiwan, what we uh, create is a system of what we call reverse mentors. So usually when a young person enters a large organization, the senior person mentors the young, the junior one. But we deliberately choose uh, every year, um, every couple of years, uh, 35 uh, young people, uh, usually younger than 35. Uh, and then uh, they become uh, the mentors 
of the ministers. So I'm, I'm old now, I'm 40 now. <laughs> so I have my own uh, younger reverse mentors uh, working with me and their work is to point out the emerging um, situations just like a mentor would and mentor me uh, in the latest developments, uh, for example, around decarbonization uh, and the latest um, ideas about circular economy and things like that, which uh, in my um, childhood, uh, I'm taught uh, that economic development has negative externalities and we have to recycle and so on and the younger mentors now teach me it's not like that uh, circular economy have positive externalities the the more uh, the better you do the, the the more good you do to people uh, and nobody do recycling anymore this is upcycling <laughs> and so on so uh, basically uh, I, I learned of those emerging uh, concepts and of course I help find them the resource uh, to actually make them happen but what's important is that I actually call those young people mentors. They are cabinet level counselors of the Youth Advisory Council or in our Open Government uh, National Action Plan Steering Committee, uh, we have uh, committee members, members of the committee. Um, so uh, com for example, uh, Commissioner Wang Xuanru, uh, who is just 19 years old at, a, at this point, uh, but we, we make sure that we call her uh, Commissioner Wang <laughs> whenever <laughs> she, she enters uh, the, the meeting room and so on. So I think uh, the Thai uh, culture shares this with Taiwan in that if you have a regulation that defines a seat, a position, and a position sounds very powerful, uh, then, then that title actually uh, is equivalent to seniority. So just make sure that uh, you have uh, awesome sounding titles uh, for people younger than 35 as reverse mentors, and they can then work as peer-to-peer -peer, uh, learners, co-learners uh, with the senior decision makers. Wow, That's, I really like the idea of this psychological nudge adding into the way that we address each other. This might be something that we do not have a lot in English, um, more in the Asian language. And and you kind of like reversingly use it you know, very well to, to nudge psychological uh, uh, functions of people to think about this. Wow, that's really uh, fascinating. And I just want to ask uh, um, a little bit more about this, that is this something that uh, happened from the inside the government? Does, uh, is this practice also diffused to the other uh, like private companies or other part of the co of the uh, society as well? Mm -hmm. I noticed when I visited Taiwan, that I think the elders in Taiwan might be the most uh, uh, happy or they're the happiest or like the they feel enjoying their life yes. they don't feel guilty being mm -hmm. old that's in, right in, in at least in taipei that i mm -hmm. saw and i was mm -hmm. impressed by that too so is this like common thing in taiwan now yes. or is it still like common? yes definitely uh we, we have this uh concept in mandarin it's called qing ying gong chuang uh or um use uh senior or junior senior co-creation uh meaning that for for each uh large projects there needs to to be a kind of intergenerational solidarity in order to make it happen. Uh, and this also flips uh, the idea as a real seniority because uh, many young people are actually very senior in internet time, right? They're very senior yeah. in the internet culture <laughs> on social media and so on. And many people in their 60s and 70s maybe are spending their first couple months now uh, in social media, right? So they're, they're actually the junior, actually like babies. So so basically, uh, what, what we're saying is that uh, we need to learn uh, from each other's seniority, so to speak, each other's experience areas, but we must not lose sight on the plurality, on the, um, the ideas that different social configurations requires uh, different people to bridge the difference between people who are new to that configuration and people who are already very ver well versed in that configuration. So we make sure that we pass has uh, laws, for example, that encourage uh, the companies uh, to retain as retainers uh, the already retired employees, but as mentors uh, to the younger people, and also encourage uh, the younger, freshly uh, graduated undergrads people to serve as what we call digital transformation ambassadors. So five as a team are deployed uh, to a local business uh, or a, a social innovation organization uh, in order to help 
them digitally transformed, and they're not interns. Again, they're ambassadors from the digital world. They are reverse mentors and so on, and then we subsidize uh, most of their salaries and so on. So yes, I believe this is truly a cross-sectoral call to action. Wow. Wow. I think like this is fascinating and you have many models, not only within the government, but mm -hmm. also extending to the private uh, uh, side as mm -hmm. well. Wow. So I'm not surprised why um, the elders in Taiwan are happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I would like to move a little bit to another uh, 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 area where tech, how can technology uh, be used to solve uh, issues, social issues. And uh, 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 previously you talked about this uh, recycle or the new ecology, uh, ecosystem problem or like environmental issue as well. There were one question about, uh, is this number 11? about the, uh, I'm sorry, 20 and 11. Mm -hmm. uh, number 20 talk about the policy innovation that benefits sustainable uh, development. And I think it's also linked to the uh, question number 11 about the rare earth uh, mineral shortage that actually affect the main industry uh, in Taiwan, uh, the chip uh, uh, manufacturing industry. So how do you see uh, the, you know, the, the link between innovation and sustainable and maybe could you also address the issue of uh, chip manufacturing uh, or how it is developed or how it is so the current status of uh, Taiwan industry right now? Yeah, definitely. Uh, gladly. Uh, I, I believe uh, upcycling uh, really is a, a idea that has uh, took root, uh, especially now that we're doing climate actions uh, around the world. That is to say, the more you recycle, the more value uh, you create, because <clears throat> the recycled material could be uh, used for things that its original uh, products producer did not uh, imagine. Uh, for example, many of the um, clothes that I wear, jackets that I wear, are, were made out of upcycled denim uh, or upcycled uh, plastic bottles uh, and so on. Uh, and there's many uh, people in the textile uh, industry in Taiwan uh, working on how to make, uh, for example, one of the j uh, jackets I, I, I wore uh, quite regularly uh, is the, the, I think it's called S. Coffee. Cafe. Uh, it's uh, uh, upcycled coffee bean wastes plus upcycled plastic bottles. And together, uh, it, they made a new material that cleans itself. So I don't have to uh, take it to the laundry that often uh, just to hang it somewhere with ventilation and it just automatically cleans the odors and, and something. And I'm sure that the original coffee makers didn't think of that use. So basically it allows uh, people of very different industries to cross pollinate, uh, to learn from each other. And I think that uh, is a direct result of our social innovation uh, policies. Because in Taiwan, uh, anyone can register as a social innovation organization. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a um, credit union, a co-op, uh, a um, more traditional business uh, company, or an, any other um, organization form can say, okay, I'm going to focus on SDG this, dot, that, uh, a specific SDG target or multiple ones, and I'm committed uh, to publish my impact reports at least once a year. Uh, I agree to get uh, uh, third-party auditing as if I'm a, a public listed company, but I'm not a public listed company. So even the small and medium enterprises are encouraged because um, when people buy such socially innovative uh, positive impact goods, uh, we give them awards. I personally go out and give awards uh, to uh, any large uh, pr product purchaser uh, or service purchaser of the uh, impact businesses and organizations. And we also make sure that we highlight the best social innovations five uh, each year into our presidential hackathon so that the president commits to say, okay, this model works really well on a local uh, basis uh, using a new voting method called quadratic voting or QV, uh, more than uh, 10,000 uh, judges like jury, really, citizens uh, vote uh, which projects out of more than 200 uh, deliver the best social uh, and environmental uh, outcome. And then these local projects are then uh, 
uh, went to the presidential office uh, and in a public ceremony received a trophy from our president, Dr. Tsai Ing-wen. And the trophy is shaped like Taiwan, uh, again, upcycle material, uh, and then a small uh, projector underneath. When you turn on the projector, it projects uh, the, this trophy being handed by the president to you. So it's very meta. The trophy, it describes itself. It shows the presidential promise uh, in video uh, recording that whatever you did on the local scale, as a public servant and as a social sector or business uh, will become nationwide public policy with all the personnel, budget and law required uh, in the next fiscal year. So basically that's presidential executive power uh, to scale your ideas out in a cross-sectoral national way uh, as a hackathon award. Uh, and we hand out just five awards each year because we also have limited bandwidth to change laws and reallocate budgets. Uh, but, but even so, uh, it, it uh, created wonders uh, on, uh, for example, um, last year's champion. Uh, one of the champions uh, was a app uh, that lets people to uh, call each other uh, to uh, plan for planting the trees and carbon planting carbon sinks uh, and to visualize the impact that tree planting and collaborative taking care of trees uh, can create to the local uh, community. Uh, and if you're a uh, community builder, uh, you understand this is very easy to do in a town of say 1,000 people or 10,000 people, but very difficult to convince 23 million of people to settle on a uh, single standard or a platform. But that's what Presidential Hackathon does. Or two years ago, uh, there's a app uh, that encourage people to play like Pokemon Go, uh, but instead of uh, finding Pokemon Go uh, stations, uh, they find <laughs> drinking fountains. So you can bring your bottles there to refill them. And once you refill and taste the, the water and leave comments, you can earn coins, you can uh, earn badges, you can make friends, uh, learn stories, uh, redeem it for the local drinks, uh, and so on. It's called a tea serving app. And again, this uh, app, uh, Hongdae uh, in uh, Daiyi, in, in uh, Taiwanese uh, language. And uh, what this uh, does uh, is a kind of economy of networks. And it's only fun if, like Pokemon Go, everybody around you is playing it. And if uh, there's sufficient spots uh, that allows people to check in. Uh, and that's how the presidential hackathon works, is that it convinces uh, the gas stations uh, and also private sector, uh, like banks and so on, all joining in uh, to serve tea uh, and be listed uh, on this app using collaborative open data formats and so on. So. Uh, I hope you, you can see that basically the economic of scale is what the presidential hackathon is offering to local scale uh, social innovators and that massively improves their positive impact and their willingness to declare their impact in similar to publicly listed companies uh, and I believe that's <coughs> our main answer to question uh, 20. Uh, and from, from what I understand, uh, in Taiwan, there is uh, already uh, the Taiwan Rare Earth and Rare Resources Industry Alliance uh, specifically uh, uh, focusing uh, on recycling and also on like recycling from unlikely places, so like upcycling. Uh, but I'm, I'm not an expert uh, on this, so I'll just uh, redirect you to the Alliance uh, webpage and then they have like meeting records and things like that. I'm sure that you can uh, gauge uh, the current plans and strategies from the website that I just pasted. Uh, it's in Mandarin, but I'm sure the mission translation works. Of course, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, 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 your explanation of the how the economy of scale and economy of network can help um, scaling up. And I think this is something that uh, startups or even like the innovation social enterprise in Thailand, they are struggling about. Like they got a uh, good idea, good innovations, but no one use it or don't know how to scale up or even like the, the, the app by the government, which uh, started with very good intention, but cannot convince people or cannot facilitate people to use this as much as we want. Yeah, and uh, I, yeah, thank you very much for, for this uh, various idea of how to, to scale up. Um, I think this is the, the goal uh, that we should, should try to uh, implement. Thank you very much. And and then I would like to move to question uh, number five. It is also about how to use technology and innovation to solve problem of poverty uh, as well. Um, and this might also link to, to how uh, uh, the the social innovations uh, is also create uh, jobs for people as well. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah uh, so instead of saying solving uh, 
uh, poverty, uh, we're focusing on uh, enabling uh, people, especially young people, uh, regardless of their circumstances. Uh, you might know that in Taiwan, broadband is a human right. So even on the most rural place, uh, on the top of Taiwan, almost 4,000 meters high, the Yushan Mountain, you're still guaranteed to have symmetric broadband connection, uh, at least 10 megabits per second, I believe, uh, for just around 15 euros per month with, with unlimited data. And if you don't, it's my fault, like personally my fault. People write me emails <laughs> complaining that they are uh, <coughs> near that mountain. Like that time, there was someone quarantined uh, in the quarantine place near the Yangming Mountain, uh, and he wrote me saying um, it took me half a day to send out this email. None of the telecom providers work. Uh, ministry promised uh, broadband as a human right, but as a quarantined person for 14 days, I enjoy no human rights. It's a violation and things like that. So, uh, and then I work with the uh, National Communication Commission and uh, CH Telecom uh, to set up a repeater. Uh, Hour, uh, near the quarantine place in just two weeks uh, and then we solved the problem but by that time he's already out of quarantine uh, but he made a point of actually driving back uh, running speed test <laughs> to measure <laughs> the new uh, connection speed and posting <laughs> on social media <laughs> to hold us accountable so so when, when we say broadband is a human right uh, like tap water or running water we really mean it uh, and then based on <clears throat> broadband as a human right we then ensure that uh, in primary school uh, education uh, starting this year um, everyone have uh, not just Wi-Fi and broadband in the classroom but also uh, tablets as well uh, instead of owning a tablet uh, they can uh, work with the teacher to uh, work out how exactly best uh, to utilize the tablet. But especially uh, in the more rural indigenous places, they are uh, allowed to take the tablets uh, previously only in classrooms, uh, take them home, uh, and then uh, running various um, skill-based uh, education systems, uh, connecting them with the uh, companions in other cities, in the country, and so on, sharing uh, their indigenous culture with the rest of society, co-creation classes uh, and so on uh, they they learn uh, to express themselves and make new friends uh, to connect to as I mentioned the global neighborhood uh, as part of that uh, tablet and again because the underlying infrastructure is already guaranteed and then they learn uh, useful skills uh, right away like uh, telemedicine uh, like te telecare teleworking and things like that that can then help them to uh, make better choices in their career and then connect them better uh, to the opportunity Opportunities around the world are not limited uh, by their vicinity, uh, by their town, and things like that. So uh, I, I believe these are the kind of empowering moves that, that we do. Uh, and the most important value is always that it's not um, like uh, training for uh, skills or media literacy of just understanding what a teacher or the TV has to say, but it's an uh, idea of competence education in that they can create their own shows, they can fact check our presidential candidates during their uh, debates uh, and if they care about the local issues such as many people uh, on the um, west side of Taiwan, west south side of Taiwan care about air pollution, they can set up their own uh, PM 2.5 measurement network, the air box network that reveals how bad the PM 2.5 is and even <coughs> uh, uh, propose uh, the theories of change based on the actual data gathered uh, by the primary schools uh, and uh, to also correct the wrongs of the industries that may have emissions uh, that they uh, were previously not discovered by the journalist uh, and the Environmental Protection Authority and so on. So the, the main lesson is that they can change their environment for the better even before they turn 18. And only uh, enabled in this way could they actually find what we call purpose-based learning, a PBL. That is to say, uh, learning towards something that they know are also serving uh, their community's uh, best interests, not just uh, the, their own kind of individual career career ladders and so on. That's also very important. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Um, so uh, rather than, uh, uh, so it's empowering, right? Empowering, providing the tools so that people can use their liberty, their freedom mm -hmm. to uh, 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 
choose the way that they would like to live their life. And uh, yeah, I, I really like your idea that this is not about just providing uh, skills or training, but it's actually open more doors. It sounds to me that it opened more doors for people who might not be uh, uh, in the environment that they can can uh, access to more chances to widen the opportunity opportunities and widen the chance. And uh, it is very important that you mentioned that it has to be current tea as fundamental rights or human rights uh, so that people people can uh, know that if they do not receive it, it is actually uh, uh, something that they yeah, it's my fault. request. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that they request. And mm -hmm. I, I'm very impressed that he did not only request it for himself. Mm -hmm. And actually, the fact that he will be out of the quarantine in two weeks, actually, if he only, if he only cares for himself, he didn't have to, to wise up, right? Mm -hmm. He can he can just leave and, and then go on living his life. But he talks because he wants maybe the others who might need to be in the quarantine mm -hmm. enjoy the same mm -hmm. uh, uh, privilege, the same rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that is very fascinating. Uh, and since we talk about quarantine, maybe this question, uh, let's move to the issue about COVID-19 as question number six and uh, question number uh, 16, right? So uh, I know that you might have been asked about this uh, a lot, <laughs> about the digital technology and COVID-19. So how uh, the technology innovation can uh, uh, help prevent, uh, help to prevent and help to cope this problem. You uh, also already mentioned some examples about the QR code and also the, the uh, facilitation of uh, uh, mass and some mm -hmm. things that is uh, important in this. Uh, so, but do you have like, what are the lessons learned as like, um, two years past after COVID-19, what can technology do? How far we can rely on technology? And can technology really help us to stop infodemic? Uh, or is it some way that we, we should, something that we should learn about this two years experience of COVID-19 and technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think the main lessons that we learned uh, is that it always helps to trust the citizens. Uh, because to give no trust is to get no trust. If we don't trust mm -hmm. the citizens, we will say, oh, let's just force them to do something. They don't have to understand why. And then sooner or later, people enter a state of fatigue and they don't want to uh, obey anymore, right? Because there's only so many months that you can force people to do uh, certain things. But if on the other hand, uh, this solution, this innovation is created by the people themselves, then they discover the ways, the best ways, uh, the norms, the social um, configurations that could actually enable this kind of uh, counter pandemic measures to go on essentially forever. Uh, for example, um, around mask use, which was uh, one of the early contention points in many jurisdictions, um, the social innovators um, um, tried out all the very different ways to uh, share the, the words uh, about mask use. But then, uh, because we made sure that it's always under Creative Commons, meaning that uh, whatever you, we publish, uh, including in the um, medical officer's daily press conference, uh, are licensed under Creative Commons. It means that people can remix uh, those uh, assets, those contents, in whichever way they like. And so just like virus, right? <coughs> Some goes viral, some didn't go viral, uh, some made uh, it to the social network, some are so boring that people don't uh, bother uh, looking at it. Uh, but uh, without um, taking down anything, we can let then people uh, look at what actually has worked and what really convinced people and so on. Uh, so for example, of course, I already shared that the pink mask convinced a lot of people <laughs> uh, and later on rainbow <laughs> mask uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, the, the cute dog. Uh, the, the fun part. The Q dog uh, tried the Zong Chai, the spokes dog of the CECC, uh, shared many memes that are co created uh, with the people, uh, especially YouTubers and other creatives <coughs> in, the, in the society. For example, um, the physical distancing, uh, this one on the top left says, when you're indoor, please keep three Shibas away from one another. When you're outdoor, keep two Shibas away from one another. That's very <laughs> easy to remember. You can't unsee this, right? <laughs> or uh, on the the bottom right. <clears throat>
use. Uh, we finally settled down something that says um, um, during the COVID times, uh, don't don't be so scared that you eat your own food. Uh, this is a, a very funny uh, joke, a meme, really. So we, uh, we piggyback on an existing meme. Uh, and then uh, this meme says, um, wear a mask to protect your own face against your own unwashed hand. And, and this is brilliant because um, it, it says nothing about altruism. Uh, and it says nothing <clears throat> that are not founded uh, in something that people can immediately check, right? Instead of saying protect the elderly or protect the vulnerable or whatever it says um, your hands may be unwashed it protects against your own own hands uh, and nobody can dispute that and, and so uh, this message has the highest basic reproduction number at the highest R rate uh, and that then uh, we focus on getting the message uh, across so Basically, we use social media uh, as a way to co-create with the people. It's not just about uh, making the uh, official statements uh, useful. It's also making it fun and also enable people who want to make fun of us uh, to make fun with us. Uh, I believe that is the most important thing. And uh, around the infodemic about countering this information, it, it always helps uh, to have systems where we can actually uh, look at what are the kind of trending uh, this information information and do some contact tracing uh, about it, uh, again, modeling it exactly like uh, epidemiology. So in Taiwan, uh, we have this CoFacts uh, initiative where people mm -hmm. can report on the line platforms uh, what rumors they have received and receive real-time clarifications. Uh, it partners with many uh, like Trend Micro, Who's Call, these are our uh, leading antivirus and uh, also um, cybersecurity uh, industries, uh, and it also partners with, with the international fact check uh, network so uh, anytime you see a disinformation you can just forward to this line bot actually any of the four or so line bots uh, and then just like flagging things as spam it will feed the information to a global dashboard of uh, the training rumors and then the fact checkers start to uh, work on those usually now uh, within 60 minutes uh, which is great because uh, it's uh, shorter than the news cycle so it means that uh, the daily news uh, the, the kind of morning news or the uh, the news on the uh, lunch uh, lunchtime or dinner time would not kind of amplify this information if we get the professional journalists the balance reports uh, usually in a funny form uh, and they of course will also dedicate airtime to the funny form uh, of the countering uh, this information and so they would not uh, serve as uh, kind of accidental super spreaders <laughs> of this information right so so quick contact tracing very important uh, and then our uh, antidote our vaccines of the mind uh, is essentially just taking the viral parts, the kind of mRNA, and change the kind of spike protein. So exactly how the vaccine works. Uh, so for example, there was a rumor, this is before the pandemic, that says uh, people are being fined $1 million for pe uh, perming your hair many times a week. And then uh, this says it's not true. And then our premier, uh, but his youth, uh, right, picture. So a picture when he was young, uh, with hair, says, uh, I may be bald at the moment, but I would not punish people who look like my youth, uh, which is very funny. Uh, and then a uh, fine brain that says, what we're introducing is just a label and requirement for hair products, not for consumers. Uh, and then uh, on the bottom of the poster, which I didn't translate, is this uh, hair blower uh, and the premier as he looks now. Uh, who says, however, if you perm your hair many times a week, it will not damage your bank account, but it will damage your hair. You may end up looking like me. So uh, I think this is really good humor because he makes fun of himself. He, he's quite bald, uh, but he doesn't mean in an offensive way. Uh, and it appeals to again, intergenerational <laughs> solidarity. Uh, and, and so people share it. Uh, it's much more viral than the original disinformation. All the evening news and long, uh, morning time news love it. Uh, and so we, we didn't get uh, hurt uh, by the disinformation at all because people start to laugh about it. And then once you laugh about it, it took the outrage away, right? And so people don't feel the same outrage that enabled them to kind of mindlessly uh, share and uh, that goes to hatred or discrimination and so on. So that's uh, our principles. Uh, they are fast, they're fair, and they're fun. These are the three principles. Wow, wow. It's not only fast and fair, but it is also fun mm -hmm. as well. And adding these humor elements into things make people feel more uh, solidarity because we can uh, uh, laugh together and in, in positive way, not not like uh, in the way that we look down, looking down on each other. 
Wow, wow. I, 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 yeah, I didn't expect like this human centric answer to this question at all. But uh, it seemed to be like uh, the way that we use the humanistic side of our uh, uh, self to, to solve the problem. Wow, very fascinating. And uh, I would like to move on to another issue on gender equality. There were many questions on this and, and, and uh, some asked about how technology, uh, I think it was uh, question number 14, 15 and 27, uh, that uh, how technological tools can enhance gender equality in the society and uh, also like the success of Taiwan as the first country in Asia to approve same-sex marriage. Uh, is there anything to do with the culture or with the culture of uh, accepting diversity? Or was it something to do with the technological advancement in the country? And uh, um, also how Taiwan overcome the gender barrier and become more like, you know, welcoming uh, different gender into the important public positions. Okay. Yeah. Well, these are all, all very good uh, kind of seminar level questions, uh, but I understand that we have limited time, so I'll be brief uh, in, the, in the answers. Um, uh, I, I think uh, what we are seeing uh, in Taiwan is that uh, it's not just about uh, fighting for the freedoms and the rights and so on for the so-called minority uh, uh, of the population. We, we, we don't frame things this way. We, we frame things more in a kind of intersectionality kind of way, like leaving no one behind, like universal design and things like that. And also affects the way that, for example, I, I talk about my own gender experience. Uh, as you probably know, I'm the world's first uh, openly transgender uh, minister. Um, everyone else may be you know in the closet and still transgender we don't know if I am openly transgender uh, and so uh, the the point I'm making to the uh, public sector in the HR uh, about my gender experience it's not that I identify as this or that actually if you look at my Twitter um, my pronouns are whatever like like literally whatever you can call me whatever uh, and then I, I would say for example I had my first puberty experience when I was 13 and my second puberty experience when I was 24, but instead of excluding half of population and later on the other half of the population, I would say uh, I share some common experience with you and then I share some, some common experience with someone else, uh, And but it doesn't bring us uh, more apart, it brings us together because we can talk about our shared experience uh, during the puberties and so on. So basically by focusing on intersectionality, it became less of a labeling exercise, uh, but more of a seeking out common values exercise. Um, in Taiwan, for, for decades, we thought Thailand would be first to pass uh, marriage equality. <laughs> I believe that everyone in Asia thought that. Uh, but in Taiwan, uh, we were able to overcome that precisely because uh, we redefined marriage, so to speak, uh, in a way that's respectful uh, for each uh, different generations and their traditions. Uh, we uh, discovered that no matter people are pro or against uh, same-sex marriage, uh, they all agree that a uh, kind of um, uh, long-lasting union between two individuals are important, uh, but their difference is only about the family uh, values in it, because uh, people who married after 2008 in Taiwan is always by registration, and they tend to see marriage as something that's between the two wedded persons. It's a kind of uh, civic registration that concerns rights and duties. Uh, but before 2007, um, many people wed uh, their families. That's to say, they held a public ceremonies of two families joining together. Uh, the two individuals are, are just like the representatives of their families, uh, and it's more about kinship, uh, uh, mother-in-law, mother-in-law relationships uh, than, than anything else. Uh, they don't have to register to the government. They can register later. Uh, the analogy was that it's like the, ch the child is born, of course it's born, uh, and then what you register uh, is uh, for the household registration uh, can take some time, right? So um, it, there's two different uh, experiences of marriage mm -hmm. in Taiwan, depending on which generation you are in. Uh, and basically by legalizing marriage equality to be just 
just about the bylaw relationship that rights and duties, but never about the in law relationship to same sex couples mm -hmm. when they're with. They don't form uh, kinship uh, with the other families. Uh, we make sure that we respect both traditions while honoring the common points about the uh, cherished values of uh, committed relationships uh, between individuals together. And then after a constitutional court ruling and two referenda, people are fine with that. So uh, while there were, of course, some tensions before the referenda, uh, by saying, no, we're just legalizing the bylaws, not the in-laws, uh, we create something that uh, people can live with. And it doesn't feel like a compromise. It feels like a innovation. So this is how uh, mm -hmm. innovation or social innovation contributes uh, to this revolution of uh, marriage equality. I believe this is very important. Now, back to the technological tools part. Uh, I believe one of the most uh, important uh, technology uh, is open data. Uh, in 2014, when Taiwan pushed uh, for open data, uh, we set up many uh, platforms about the open data uh, national platform uh, that won, I think, three consecutive years top uh, at the Open Data Index of the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, before they just stop uh, measuring altogether. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we also, of course, as a, uh, a signatory, uh, voluntary signatory of the CEDAW, uh, of the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, uh, we made sure that we have uh, a, a system uh, that's tracked all the gender's participation called a significant gender statistics database. And this uh, significant database is really, really comprehensive because in the public service, all the, uh, all the laws in draft form, all the multi-year projects do not receive approval or budget until they do their gender impact assessment with the Gender Equality Committee. Uh, and so no matter whether you work on the Ministry of Labor or Finance or whatever, you may think your job has nothing to do with gender. Uh, some uh, friendly civil society organization are going to help you <laughs> to measure for the impact to ensure fair representation in stakeholder consultation and so on. Uh, and the number that's being tracked, for example, the percentage of uh, leadership uh, positions, uh, the percentage of parliamentarians, uh, for example, at the moment it's over 40, right, for, for women. It didn't start at over 40. <laughs> so uh, whenever uh, people start measuring this, it, it just doesn't stop. Uh, we just keep measuring uh, for these gender-related uh, sex and gender-disaggregated uh, statistics. Um, and so it forms after um, nowadays um, more than 10 years, I believe, of gender equality committees work, a very solid theory of change that people can then introduce policy while being very aware in an evidence-based way of whatever uh, stakeholders we're going to to, the, to uh, touch upon, uh, they are ready also to talk uh, with you on how to implement this in the most inclusive way. And then that also brings us to, to uh, 27 because then uh, this intersectionality is already kind of gender mainstreaming, already part of our public servants culture. So soon as the two referenda results are out about marriage equality, our public servants know exactly how to implement it because after uh, more than a decade of gender mainstreaming work, they know exactly how the solution space look like. Uh, and so for example, uh, when I set up my own office uh, at a social innovation lab, as a real office, used to be a uh, Air Force headquarters uh, and uh, uh, air, 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 of course the Air Force didn't uh, care that much about universal uh, design or things like that, uh, LGBTIQ in inclusion, because after all they were constructed uh, almost a century ago. Uh, so we do a lot of remodeling, uh, reshaping it to the Social Innovation Lab. Not only do we uh, include people of all the different needs, for example, uh, this soccer field here are co-created with people with Down syndrome, with trisomy differences. Uh, we want to make sure it's not just wheelchair accessible or elderly accessible or um, white keen uh, seeing difficulty accessible but also neurodiversity accessible uh, and uh, because we tore down all the walls it also need to include the input of everyone uh, living nearby uh, and because they're going to use it and they do uh, as a public park and so uh, inevitably uh, the restrooms uh, question came right uh, so how many restrooms in which configuration should we build on the ground floor uh, and 
unfortunately, uh, because of gender mainstreaming work, the Ministry of Interior already know the answer. <laughs> there is a recommendation uh, from one of their earlier consultations. Uh, so uh, just on the other side of, the, uh, actually, uh, no, just nearby uh, this soccer field, if you extend uh, horizontally, uh, the four corners of the soccer fields correspond to four restrooms, uh, one for a ladies' room, one for a gentlemen's room, one for gender neutral, and one for wheelchair accessible. Uh, and they're built with exactly equal area, uh, and there's no uh, no one left behind, so to speak. And so this is how we can then say, well, then uh, it maximizes uh, people's convenience. Uh, it provably shortens people's queue time, wait time, as compared to its previous configuration. And again, they are incremental improvement. It leaves no one behind. It doesn't make anyone feel less safe than before or make anyone less convenient than before. And that is how we uh, become more open and inclusive in all the space related configurations. Hope that answers the question. Wow, wow. Um, so I think this is very important lesson that uh, change doesn't happen in, in a night, in overnight. So maybe uh, when we talk about um, Taiwan same-sex marriage law, we will look at the, we usually look at the constitutional court ruling and then the referendum, but actually, just as you said, that the history started well before mm -hmm. that, right, uh, with the mainstreaming, gender mainstreaming work. Can I ask a little bit more about that, like, where, where did it start? Like, how did it come into the scene? And uh, of, of course, you tell us about how it is, uh, became how it became the common mm -hmm. theme uh, of the public servants, at least even uh, agree or not, at least they became very uh, familiar with it. So how, how mm -hmm. did it start from the beginning? Yeah, uh, a lot of it uh, were uh, the work of our previous uh, vice president, uh, noted uh, feminist uh, movement uh, leader, uh, Annette Lu, uh, Lu Xiaolian. Uh, and when she uh, became the uh, vice president, I believe uh, around the turn of century from 2000 to 2008, uh, she worked with her uh, feminist uh, movement uh, partners uh, in the civil society and constructed this very brilliant design <coughs> that we're still using today for the Open Government uh, National Action Plan Steering Committee uh, of the Gender Equality Committee. Uh, and the uh, design is very simple. Uh, all the impact assessment are passed through the GEC, the Equality Committee, and the Equality Committee uh, is most of the ministers related to uh, this work, uh, but uh, equal number of civil society organization leaders uh, plus one. Uh, so the CSOs always have one more vote when it comes to a vote compared to the minister. So it's a multi-stakeholder conversation with civil society at its core. It's a social sector first uh, design. And uh, if the ministers uh, are, are more men than women, uh, then proportionally, the CSO leaders are more women than men. <laughs> if the ministers are more women than men, uh, this so far have not happened, but hopefully soon, uh, then uh, the CSOs will uh, change it, its uh, gender proportion um, proportionally. Uh, and so it's always uh, strive for a kind of yin and yang balance. Uh, whenever it tilts uh, any which way in the cabinet, it will tilt exactly the other way from the civil society. And I think that's really brilliant institutional design. Wow, wow, very interesting, and um, yeah, and listening to to your your uh, uh, story, uh, we heard a lot about the uh, civil society, the importance of civil society, and how the grassroots movement of can people participate with uh, the um, both governmental work development and new uh, solutions. Then I would like to jump to the question about civic hacking or uh, civic uh, uh, participation mm -hmm. movement. Uh, based on technology, uh, number 31 and 32 before we, we break um, and maybe we talk. Um, of course, you are famous for leading this group of civic tech and also integrate them into uh, uh, the many works of the government. How could you please uh, tell the story of this and how it became so impactful with the uh, policy innovation and uh, of course, we have this question about what is the di actually the difference between civic hacker and civic participation? Sure. Well, uh, civic hacking is uh, uh, one way of <clears throat> civic participation, but it's, it's of course not the only way. Uh, and uh, participation can, of course, happen on many different uh, ways. For example, people may uh, collaborate to set the agenda, right? Uh, our question and answer today is crowdsourced 
And so this is about mm. defining the agenda, agenda setting, uh, problem definition. So those are on the earlier stages. Uh, and then the later stages would be on, for example, solution identification, on developing things once we are already have some common values together. So this is the, the implementation uh, part. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also the evaluation oversight, which as fellow civil yeah. service, of course, we know that's actually the most important uh, part in making sure that whatever decisions must be carried through, or at least uh, providing an account of why it didn't quite happen the way that we designed it and so on. That's also very important. But civic hacking uh, adds a twist to it. Instead of uh, demonstrating against something, protesting the lack of oversight or evaluation, uh, people can simply fork the government. Fork uh, is a uh, technical term. That means taking some things already there, not writing it off, but w while it try to grow to a certain direction, you fork like a fork uh, into a different direction. So you can take an existing digital service and then change it toward the way that you want it to work instead, uh, usually for the better, hopefully for the better. Uh, in Taiwan in 2012, uh, there uh, was this, uh, still is a, a very important movement called Gov Zero or G0V movement. And the G0V movement's call to action is very simple. For all the government web services uh, that always ends in something.gov.tw, the Gov Zero people find the ones that they didn't like. But instead of protesting, demonstrating against it, they demonstrate in a demo uh, to build a uh, website that's exactly the same except the O is changed to a zero. So something that G0V, the TW. So instead of the citizen participation portal, join the GOV, the TW, change your O to a zero, you get to the shadow government, join the G0V, the TW, and so on. Uh, by systematically looking at all the government services and fork it for the better, it creates a new venue uh, for people who are fed up with digital services by the government. Instead of uh, showing uh, that people are angry, um, this turns outrage into co-creation. So in theoretical terms, uh, civic hacking is a kind of civic participation that is co-creation on open innovations including open source, open hardware, open design, open access, and, and many things. So basically all the GovZero creations are also open in nature so that people who don't like GovZero services can fork it again and make something more. Uh, so for example, what you're looking at is the real-time mask availability for more than 6,000 pharmacies. People, when they queue in line, can check those numbers uh, and see exactly how many masks uh, do the person queue before them uh, just purchase. Uh, and so this uh, made people feel very safe and very swift as well uh, because people uh, then don't buy in the conspiracy theories about the mask going nowhere or being hoarded or things like that people can see is actually working as intended and they don't have to queue in vain if some place turns red or uh, gray uh, just don't go there you can go someplace that's a little bit farther by green uh, and so on but the important thing of Gov Zero is that because it's open and based on real time open data, more than 100 different tools, maps for people who want to use maps, for elderly people who don't want to use a map, uh, certainly chatbots based on the line application, people with seeing difficulties, well, voice assistance and so on. So people with different needs get to fork the digital service in all those different directions to ensure maximal access for everyone who are concerned about the way that the masks are rationed. And then this helps the evaluation because when we offer uh, the real-time inventory every 30 seconds, this means that the public servants are never to blame. This is, this is counterintuitive, so I will, I will expand on it a little bit more. Uh, certainly you have a Freedom of Information Access FOIA process, but if you publish statistics only a quarter, uh, after the fact, quarterly report or yearly report, or after FOI access usually takes two months or so in order to find out the information and send it back uh, to the FOI request. Uh, already the situation is passed, and if people's memory don't agree with the number they receive from you, 
Well, you are to blame because you are the gatekeeper of that information. But by saying no, uh, in the pharmacy, whenever they sell uh, some ration mask, the system automatically updates uh, every 30 seconds. Everybody understands there's no way our public service can review the numbers uh, every 30 seconds in more than 6,000 pharmacies. So obviously, no public servant has, has looked at those numbers. And therefore, if the numbers are wrong, we are not to blame. <laughs> if the numbers are wrong, we collectively figure out what's wrong because nobody are the gatekeepers. Um, and so very mm. quickly after this uh, mask rationing map is published, the open street map community, uh, which is active in many jurisdictions, uh, discovered there is a serious data bias. Uh, because when we designed this system uh, in Taipei, uh, our capital city, uh, we say, yeah, it's very equal because uh, it's uh, very much overlapping with population centers. We made sure that our distribution of masks corresponds almost one-to-one -to, -one to population. So each person in Taiwan, on average, is of a very equitable distance to a nearest available mask. And we're quite happy about that. But the open stream community says um, that is not true because not everyone own a helicopter. What looks like the same distance on the map translates to different travel time, especially if you have to take public transportation. Uh, taking the metro, that's maybe just 20 minutes. But taking a bus, uh, especially in a rural place, multiple buses, um, the same distance on the map it will take three hours uh, to get through. And by the time you get to the pharmacy, the pharmacy is already closed. Uh, and uh, so obviously the numbers are wrong. But instead of blaming our public service, we get to say, well, you have the same numbers. How can you do better? Uh, and then the Open Street Map community via a MP, a member of parliament, uh, bring this up in the interpolation. Uh, and then Minister Chen simply said, uh, legislator teach us. And, and the legislator, because she was VP of Data Analytics at Foxconn, uh, she, she can't say, no, I don't know. Right? <laughs> She's actually an expert on this. <laughs> and so, so she said, yeah, you just do this and that. And then we implemented a better rationing scheme and also introduced pre-registration 24 hours after this interpolation. And so this changes the relationship between the citizens, representatives, and the public sector. We're no longer the only one that can be held accountable. We can also say, yeah, provide a better account. Why don't you do so? After all, you have the same data and the same source code as we have. And, and people do do that. And then, of course, it creates a much more trustworthy relationship. So trusting our citizens is only possible by enabling the civic hackers to uh, really make a difference and commit to, if they truly have a better idea, implement that idea as soon as possible. Hope that answered the question. Wow, wow. It, it does really answer the question. And I think, uh, yeah, we, we, we sense the, now we see the very example of how decentralization can help uh, develop more uh, co-creations or even like uh, uh, provide better solution over that. Decentralization doesn't always mean fragmentation. It can mean co-creation as well. Wow. And, and in Thailand as well, we see a lot of uh, problem of data transparency. People want to know more. Different governmental agencies say different things. And and yeah, many people are, are also suggested that yeah, if we have the same set of data, then we can at least work on the same um, ground. And then we may uh, suggest different way of analysis or different angles to look at the issue, at least we do not have to uh, argue about the facts, right? So, so wow, very, very good uh, example, good explanation over there, very clear. Um, thank you so much for the first half. I think uh, time flies. Uh, we already, I think we are doing very well in terms of time. Uh, we did cover about the vision on tech, the specific issue that tech can help solving. Also, we cover the um, gender equality issue, COVID-19 or environmental issues. And also very importantly, the participation by citizens to improve or to enhance the digital or tech innovation, social innovation. Um, Let's uh, have a break and then after that we will talk more, uh, we will shift to the issue of new technology and also digital education looking forward, uh, looking toward the new uh, uh, upcoming century, what uh, 
years that what we should do how should we take this new technology there are so many questions about the new technology exciting one and then maybe we can talk about your leadership as well you did uh, already uh, explain many things that's already impressed a lot of people here i can see that their face they're nodding heads but maybe we can uh, dig a little bit more over there about how what is the leadership needed for this century so maybe we have around 15 minute break would that be all right okay and then we come back to Together again at uh, two thirty. I'm sorry, it's not. It's not two on your side, yes, but then okay. fifteen minutes later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So see you in fifteen minutes. Bye. Yes. Coming up in the chat box as well, and uh, very nice to uh, sharing some more links uh, that we can exchange on the, related to the issues that we are talking about as well. So uh, for the participants, please feel free to. Uh, uh, put in the chat box your questions or your feedback or comments or and and I will open the floor uh, for more questions as well or you can also uh, uh, you know specify that you would like to to ask question live uh, then we should have that session and please please feel free to do that in Thai language as well I will uh, facilitate if necessary. Okay, Minister, please uh, let's uh, go directly to the next issue that we have right now, which is an exciting one, uh, new technology. Uh, uh, maybe we start from the questions of Metaverse, uh, which are the questions number one, number 12, and I think also number 13. Uh, so. Of course, we, we know this is the buzzword of 2021, right? <laughs> and uh, might be uh, another buzzword for this year as well. And um, the questions are, what is your opinion? How Taiwan prepare for it? How uh, possible it will be uh, applied to our life? And do you believe full immersion VR possible? And how long it will take for this technology to be realized? Yeah, I mean, for, for many people, uh, they, they saw the term Metaverse in 2022, and it feels very new. But for me, that's uh, three decades old uh, term. Uh, I, I encountered the term, uh, like many people reading Snow Crash, I believe published in 92. <laughs> so actually, th three decades have passed. Uh, I think I read about it in, in 93, 94, uh, when I was just uh, very much into internet uh, and uh, multi-user dungeons or mud uh, development, which you could say is a text-based metaverse, I guess. Uh, and then, uh, so, so it, it brings um, to me a sense of nostalgia, uh, like uh, the, the good days uh, of the 90s. Uh, and and I, I'm probably not alone in this. Um, in, in my uh, first um, startup, 96, uh, uh, we, we called our projects the Cyber Eye because uh, cyberspace uh, was the buzzword back then. It's uh, synon synonymous uh, with Metaverse, <laughs> I believe. <laughs> it says the same thing. Um, and it's uh, the shared reality part of my job description. It means that we should be able to take not just what we type, not just what, what we say, uh, or the, this two-dimensional camera, but so we should uh, just pack uh, our entire ambience uh, and then ship it uh, to other people in other places. And then we can share our reality and then uh, actually talk about the weather, not just talk about the microphone levels as a proxy of the weather. Right? So that's the original motivation uh, of made have us. Now, I believe this became a buzzword again. Uh, because something happened uh, between the 90s uh, when everyone can be their own web master uh, writing their own web log <laughs> and so on uh, and 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 now uh, which is everyone's home page look pretty much the same because they're just hosted on a few major platforms. Uh, and uh, back in the day, um, people uh, were operating uh, with their, their own communication providers, but we relate them together. Uh, that's the Internet Relay Chat, uh, which became uh, the XMPP. Uh, nowadays, the instant messengers, uh, many of them still use XMPP, but they don't uh, relay anymore. Uh, so on our phones, uh, our instant messengers can't really send to other 
instant messages and recipients they become silos and so on so uh, the, the centralization the re-centralization of what used to be a decentralized technology namely the internet the world web is what happened uh, between the time when metaverse and cyberspace uh, first became popular and now when it became popular again so for me it's, it's calling back uh, to uh, truly nostalgic call, calling back uh, to the 90s uh, ethos uh, that is to say people should be able to arrange their own realities uh, should be able to share uh, reality as we configure it we should not be uh, limited uh, to the kind of colorless imaginations or single color monocolored uh, um, relationships uh, as envisioned uh, by uh, a social media company with just a, a like uh, to press well now they have five or six different emotions but you know what I mean right so instead of a, a <coughs> something <clears throat> more more monotonous we want to go back uh, to the old days uh, where it could be a true plurality a pluriverse a multiverse um, and so um, the, the difference nowadays of course is that immersion takes a, a variously different form uh, as compared to previously in the 90s when uh, really the only uh, low latency medium is uh, text and maybe smileys uh, and animated gif but not, nothing more than that uh, we really want to animate our avatars uh, in shared realities as well we want to bring <coughs> more of ourselves and our environment in especially after the um, sometime harrowing um, experience in the past couple of years uh, because of the COVID, it increased the appetite uh, for a truly social, immersive reality. So I don't think Mar Mark Zuckerberg uh, imagined it. Uh, I believe <coughs> the credit goes to Neil Stevenson, uh, the author of Snow Crash, uh, and uh, many other uh, science fiction authors uh, around that time. Uh, and I think Taiwan prepares ourselves uh, for the metaverse uh, by ensuring, <coughs> as I mentioned, that people feel competent uh, in arranging their realities. That is to say, uh, as competent uh, as we are to look at each other's <coughs> spreadsheets and changing the formulas uh, to fork each other's spreadsheets. I'm sure many people here knows how to do that. Uh, many of our children uh, knows to uh, play interactive video games that they found on the Scratch uh, programming platform and then change the color uh, to be their favorite color uh, or to change the avatar of the protagonist of the hero to look like themselves uh, or to change the background music or whatever. Many young children's first programming exercise uh, was arranging together a open hardware Arduino Raspberry Pi uh, or some open software like in Scratch uh, and so on. Again, uh, we need to preserve uh, that feeling of people uh, having the capacity like we can arrange our furniture, uh, furniture in our uh, homes and offices. We need to have the same confidence in arranging our relationships uh, in the metaverse and truly would then uh, become a shared reality in a multiverse, uh, not just uh, a, another top-down world garden that doesn't interface with anything else. Now, uh, the thing about fully immersive VR, well, it's already there. Right, the future is already there, it's just not <laughs> evenly distributed. Um, when uh, <coughs> Neuromancer was written, uh, uh, I believe, um, already the author has experience uh, on fully immersive virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So the technology, if you're a uh, fighter uh, jet pilot, <laughs> already exists for, for uh, a long time. It was just either very expensive or you can only stay in it for a very short amount of time uh, because of uh, issues about uh, the, the uh, orientation, the foveation and things like that that prevents uh, long time exposure on virtual reality. Uh, so immersion is already there. It's just for how long would you like to be immersed uh, in it? And I happen to believe that um, only way that people would like to immerse in virtual reality is that it's extending our existing reality. That is to say, it has a kind of fully adjustable opacity mode. Uh, because if we spend our time in virtual reality to the exclusion of our bodies, 
um, this in, this embodied feeling actually doesn't feel good, uh, and people don't want to spend um, hours and hours without a body. It, it feels truly truly weird. Uh, on the other hand, if we can bring uh, our vicinity in, uh, like live streaming uh, our uh, vicinity, so that people in different places can uh, kind of sit uh, uh, alongside ourselves. Actually, I, I uh, sometimes create uh, some painting uh, sessions uh, initially using tilt brush. Uh, uh, really like sculpturing or right? sculpturing virtual reality, uh, but uh, making sure that uh, I bring into the scenario what's actually in this room or in the uh, vicinity, in the community. And for example, when I arrange a conversation session uh, in shared reality, at the time using the open source tool High Fidelity, uh, when I was in Paris in 2016 with a bunch of uh, high school and primary school students uh, in Taiwan, uh, we made sure that we not only brought our own avatars in, but I shrunk myself to the height of the children so that in their familiar ground, they don't have to look up to me. Uh, they, they treat me literally as their equals of equal height. Uh, and, and so that we can share the reality from their perspective. Uh, I also work with some art uh, university students in Kaohsiung who at the time were uh, collaboratively designing a project of walking down the memory lane uh, with very old people, seniors uh, in the community. Again, they scan themselves into the 3D avatars, apply some um, uh, deep faking technology uh, to make themselves look young again, uh, and then they take as a tour mm -hmm. uh, to the community as they remember in the old streets and so on, uh, but not as a solo trip, but as kind of touring guide uh, to bring the nowadays young people to the young people of their own memory that's themselves, uh, like talking like a young person to another young person, like showing them around uh, in a different configuration of the same streets that they both have been to and so on. So shared reality, it's not a kind of abstract thing. It must stem from the actual reality, either in our memory, in our vicinity, from a different perspective, and so on, that uh, warrants to be shared uh, to people who care about each other, to uh, take each other's sides, to step into each other's shoes, uh, so to speak. And this kind of emotion is on a people-to-people -people term. I believe that's the only kind of emotion that's worth pursuing. Otherwise, we'll just be trapped in our solo realities and we'll actually be isolating even more compared to the two-dimensional video conferencing we're having now. Mm -hmm. I see. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that sounds. Uh, with your examples, I think uh, make uh, immersion technology seems to be more realistic or extending from our human reality. And I really like the word you use, shared reality. Thank you very much for that. Uh, 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 you know, this is a very good start of exciting technology. And since uh, we, and I think uh, your uh, uh, narrative uh, of looking at the internet being trying, people on internet trying to uh, decentralize again, mm -hmm. going back to the, the very beginning of this is very interesting. And I think this also linked to the issue of cryptocurrency mm -hmm. as well. Um, the previous Metaverse question also cover question number 26 already, mm -hmm. too. And uh, we also uh, have some questions regarding cryptocurrency. It is number uh, 22, 25, uh, also 19. And uh, yeah, so, so these uh, three questions mm -hmm. that we have regarding cryptocurrency so how do you see a uh, future uh, does this decentralize on the financial side uh, how would it impact or our society or is it what what are the challenges regarding this and what is the plan for Taiwan on this as well yeah um... In 2010, when I first became a uh, independent contractor uh, with Apple, working with the Siri team, um, I negotiated my my rate to be one Bitcoin per hour. Um, uh, of course, in 2010, that's that's nothing, <laughs> right? It's it's not uh, what it costs now. Um, but uh, I, I've been contracting under one Bitcoin per hour for for many years. Uh, 2013, 2014. Uh, of course, my consulting rate increased kind of naturally when <laughs> measured in fiat. <laughs> but, uh, but by, by the time I become a, a minister uh, in 2016, I had to uh, say, no, actually, I don't take 
crypto uh, as payment uh, and Apple never paid me crypto anyway because uh, they couldn't figure out how to uh, wire uh, crypto uh, back in 2010 uh, so we just based on the contract date uh, to settle on exchange rate and they paid me in, in fiat uh, and I every year I have to do my public declaration of my assets and I have to keep saying that I own no crypto assets <laughs> because I don't want to be seen as doing money laundering or uh, doing some uh, investment advice or things like that uh, and uh, in the past couple years uh, I, I say that with more urgency because it's becoming then very clear uh, that Bitcoin is not helping uh, the climate uh, situation I'm sure you uh, are well aware uh, of this uh, and so um, back when Vitalik Buterin uh, visited Taiwan he's the first guest that I uh, received uh, in my residence as a teleworking minister uh, in 2016 uh, I also talked to him about the climate actions uh, that's re required a, a hard fork even uh, that's required and so on so I'm really glad that I think this year uh, the uh, sustainable transition uh, will hopefully be completed uh, by Ethereum uh, to proof of stake uh, after which I can in good conscience say uh, now I hold <laughs> a cryptocurrency again because it's not going to damage uh, the destiny of our next generation so um, it, it's quite clear that uh, because people's interest in crypto has skyrocketed uh, people are becoming increasingly aware of the negative environmental or societal uh, impacts that it has had uh, toward income inequality uh, based on asymmetrical information and things like that and I'm, I'm happy that people are uh, dedicating time uh, to to work on these issues so uh, in in my job my day job as a digital minister I make sure that I make a distinction uh, between cryptocurrency which I'm not yet touching because uh, sustainability reasons uh, but uh, the distributed ledger technology or DLTs mm -hmm. that underlies the cryptocurrency the financial application but we do use DLTs uh, DLTs are very useful um, you may have uh, already heard me mention in the previous half of the talk uh, that we treat the more than 100 mask availability visualization like nodes uh, in a ledger uh, append only immutable uh, or that uh, people can measure in their primary school uh, the air pollution air uh, P to PM 2.5 levels again contributing to a distributed ledger uh, without it being a actual cryptocurrency or blockchain and so on so just like uh, relational databases decentralized databases uh, that is append only and immutable has a variety of uses and we uh, use many of these innovations coming from the Ethereum community in our daily uh, public service work for example the presidential hackathon uh, won the popular acclaim precisely because the uh, more than 10,000 people voted using the new voting method quadratic voting from the Ethereum community instead of one person uh, one vote uh, which if you have run any internet voting campaigns uh, you know that it's guaranteed to make a majority of people unhappy uh, we designed the vote so that each person have 99 points and in more than 200 different projects you can allocate the points to any number of projects but it's quadratic meaning that um, to vote one vote it costs you one point two votes four three votes nine uh, four votes sixteen so with 99 points you can vote at most nine votes but not ten votes to any particular mm -hmm. project because that would cost 100 uh, and many people don't want to squander their votes so after voting for their friends or family's pet project nine votes they still have some left right they have 18 left so they're compelled to find another project of sustainability related uh, goals and learn about it and maybe vote for which is 16 and they still have two points left and say so, so they learn about at least two more project and maybe they discover some synergy so they take some of the nine votes back maybe they do a seven and seven and so on so the design is that um, every uh, marginal return of each vote uh, when it comes to impacting the result is the same as the marginal cost in points so people are compelled to actually evaluate and vote truthfully uh, and not uh, kind of gaming the system and at the end of the day when we chose the top 20 we now have a synergy map so the uh, 200 project that didn't make the cut know 
which project of the top 20 do they, uh, um, they are compelled to join because of the popular demand of the synergies of their deliverables. So at the end of the day, nobody feel they have lost. Uh, out of the five or six uh, projects you have voted, uh, much more likely than not uh, that at least one or two made it to the top 20. And even if they didn't, uh, if those didn't, they can rejoin the top 20 teams based on this uh, positive sum uh, voting design. And this came uh, straight from the East Syrian community. And we use uh, ma many uh, democratic designs uh, from that community, so much so that I say, you know, democracy is a social technology. Uh, and if you is a kind of higher bandwidth, lower latency way to experience with consensus making technology. So they are like our research arm when it comes to governance, uh, which may, may or may not uh, blow up spectacularly, uh, but of the design that did work, uh, we then become their development arm uh, to try to scale it out and scale it up to make sure that the governance of the cryptocurrency can also be the governance mechanism that improves our day-to-day -day democracy. So the skills required, I believe are exactly the same as the ones that uh, serve the public uh, in the uh, public sector, that is to say the ability to listen um, actively uh, at scale and design together with the citizens, and these are the most important skills. Wow. Wow, very fascinating, and and yes, that's uh, your your story make it uh, make mathematics sounds very uh, sexy right now. Yeah, because it's it's contributed to to the the uh, behavior of people, and again, very human centric. Uh, we, we you you explain about how we can apply technology in a way that will not uh, defy the human nature or the uh, human uh, instinct. Right. Very, very interesting. I think we have another new technology uh, left in our list on number uh, question number 34 on quantum con computing. Uh, it is anticipated that this will disrupt all business and industrial sectors in the future. What is your perspective and how Taiwan prepare for this challenge, mm -hmm. if you see it as a challenge? Yeah. Um, of course, it is a challenge, uh, especially on the cryptographic uh, fronts. Uh, we're now already working on post-quantum uh, algorithms, I believe, in the U.S.-based NIST uh, challenges. Uh, two of the final candidates uh, have contributions from Taiwanese teams, so we have pretty good contributions uh, in this area internationally. Uh, and some of the post-quantum uh, lattice-related uh, math also contributes uh, to applications now not waiting for a quantum computer. Uh, for example, it contributes to uh, this uh fully homomorphic encryption, that's a mouthful, the, the FHE um, way of thinking about computation. I'm sure that you, if you work with public cloud providers and private data, you know there's a fundamental dilemma in that maybe the citizen trusts you and you trust the cloud provider, but the citizen doesn't trust the cloud provider. <laughs> and if you uh, do computation on the cloud provider, you end up losing some citizens' trust. And if they don't trust you, they don't get you uh, accurate or timely information. And so at the end of the day, everybody loses. Uh, and there were no uh, good way to fix this problem uh, until the advent of homomorphic encryption. Uh, so using post-quantum uh, algorithms, our National Center for High-Speed Computation is already deploying uh, ways that uh, allows us to decouple raw data storage and access with computation. So the idea is very simple. Uh, we have some private raw data from our citizens uh, stored on site, on premise. We encrypt that by putting it in a safe locket. And then we send the encrypted one, the safe, uh, to the cloud provider. Uh, and then the cloud provider knows nothing about what's within. But magically, mm. they can do computations on its content. Uh, like if the safe contains many uh, stacked Lego blocks, you can say, oh, let's shuffle it. You can shuffle Lego blocks within the safe without uh, knowing how many blocks there are. Of course, it's intuitive uh, because it introduces entropy. Uh, but using post-quantum cryptography, uh, counterintuitively, uh, it turns out you can't do any kind of computation like solving a Rubik's Cube uh, outside of the safe without learning anything about what's inside the safe. So it's really quite magical. And once it's done, it's 
it's sent back and then you decrypt it and get the result. So it allows you to perform arbitrarily complex computation in public cloud providers without ever disclosing even just one bit of private information uh, to those uh, cloud providers. And that is one of the early fruits uh, of our investment into post-quantum algorithmic research. I'm sure there's many other research uh, on this front. So uh, we uh, both uh, invest in fundamental like basic science and math, but as you said, uh, math could be sexy uh, in its application. So we also make sure that uh, we record popular Instagram uh, videos uh, or whatever uh, comic books and manga and so on that talks about those sexy applications and privacy enhancing technologies. Wow. Yeah, so not only the, the sexy part of application, but also the fundamental research, mm -hmm. right? That will be the, the basis of uh, the how to how a society can mm -hmm. uh, get along with the new technology and challenges. Yeah. Wow. Thank you very much on that end. And then we can uh, move to another big topic, actually. <laughs> um, we received around four questions about digital education and digital divide. Uh, so it is qu uh, question number nine, number 21, uh, 23 and 33. So um, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think we can expect that during this situation that uh, new technology is coming, what are the skills required for the next decade? Uh, what are what should we do for the digital divide? It's already happened in uh, city and rural area and maybe internationally as well. And also, uh, what can what are the skills that 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 we should teach? Uh, students or we should try to have the learning process and also the question of how uh, school or university, especially university, uh, should reinvent itself in the day that um, something that we teach today might be already outdated uh, 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 once the student graduate. So could you please share your view on mm -hmm. uh, digital education and the problem of digital divide? Certainly. Um, so I, I think one of the uh, most important thing that I learned uh, as a um, autonomous learner um, is that uh, it's not about homeschooling. Uh, I actually spent uh, very few hours of the day in my home <laughs> when I uh, quit uh, the school when I was 15 years old, when I was uh, on the um, eighth grade. Um, indeed, uh, I spent most of the time at a nearby university, uh, at the research labs uh, and things like that. So um, although the question is correct in, in saying that I've not been graduated from a fam famous university university, uh, I've come to learn that it really doesn't matter. That the professors, as long as my research interests align with their research interests, uh, they don't care if I uh, am paying tuitions <laughs> in the university. <laughs> all, all they want are research partners. <laughs> so so uh, what, what, what matters is that you have a good grasp on an open research problem that many people cares about. Uh, so uh, w when I was 15 years old, for example, uh, I was uh, very fascinated uh, with this idea of swift trust, of why people who've never met each other, just because a hashtag is correct or a picture looks right, uh, come to trust uh, a lot uh, about uh, their closely knit community or trust each other, so much so that they treat themselves uh, like the best friends of each other and so on. Uh, it's inexplicable. It never happens uh, in uh, real life, uh, maybe just in movies, uh, but online we see that uh, happens a lot. On the other hand, uh, a, a badly designed antisocial social media also manufacture swift distrust. So previously best friends uh, end up blocking each other very quickly <laughs> on certain uh, badly designed social media. So uh, it seems that it polarizes people uh, toward swift trust and distrust. Uh, so so why is that? And that was very fascinating. Uh, but, but I don't uh, know any particular school or any particular uh, major uh, in any university or any degree. And answers that question. At that time, the idea of a kind of information society, uh, communication theory, and so on, were still in its infancy. Uh, and it's not very clear like which major uh, sh should I declare myself um, to be in if I want to learn about Swift Trust. So I end up just uh, attending like nine uh, different disciplines, uh, classes, uh, mostly on the graduate level, uh, learning about interaction design, game design, uh, linguistics, philosophy of the mind, 
uh, and things like that in order to kind of uh, get a hold uh, on this open research problem. But uh, my, my pitch or my uh, research brief um, it is very appealing uh, to all those professors that I encountered, uh, even across uh, or especially across the internet, right? Uh, when I write to uh, like um, prominent researchers like uh, Douglas Hofstadt uh, of Goethe Escherbach, uh, he not only replied immediately, he even uh, fixed my Mandarin. He actually speaks Mandarin. <laughs> and so on. So <laughs> we, we fully leveraged um, this swift trust phenomena uh, to build a, a camaraderie uh, with uh, leading researchers on philosophies of the mind and cognitive sciences and so on. So um, I think anything that makes um, the 15 years old Audrey's life easier uh, is good uh, when we talk about education reforms. I'm talking about, of course, open courseware uh, and many other open access efforts. I'm talking about Project Gutenberg and many other other uh, free access, free cultural works that uh, liberates uh, from the library um, the out of copyright works uh, so that um, a, a young Audrey can actually read all the classical works, uh, at least those outside of copyright protection uh, once written before the First World War. Maybe that's why I'm so optimistic. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, 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 so all these uh, are important, but the most important, uh, obviously, is the flexibility, the agility uh, of the researchers working in institutions, in working with uh, the stakeholders outside of those institutions. And in Taiwan, we call it University uh, Social Responsibility, or USR. And we have a dedicated USR office uh, that talks about how university makes a positive social impact through outreach programs uh, such as this, uh, through working with uh, the local community builders uh, to empower uh, the people uh, who are part of their lifelong education or uh, younger uh, people uh, who want to uh, get ahead uh, of the, the curriculum as I did uh, and then uh, accommodate them uh, within the frameworks of the higher education. So I think that uh, worked pretty well and if you're interested you can look into the USR uh, portal uh, of our uh, national administrative uh, education. Now um, I, I believe uh, the digital divide, I talk a little bit about uh, broadband uh, access, tablets, mm -hmm. uh, companion learners and so on uh, as a human right. And I, I also want to highlight that, for example, when we're uh, deploying 5G technologies, uh, we have this slogan uh, that uh, the more rural it is, the more advanced it is. That is to say the latest, most cutting edge technology. Uh -huh. uh, it could be drones uh, delivering medicine, uh, or uh, it, it could be all sort of uh, telecare uh, based on uh, self-diagnostics um, with a, a group of different specialty um, doctors uh, visiting together uh, through video communication and so on. Uh, all the enabling technologies like 5G that would enable this kind of work were first deployed in the rural places. And the theory is very simple because the social entrepreneurs working on these technologies are not yet benefiting from the network of scale and they couldn't really price their offerings very competitively uh, because of the high investment costs, high upfront. But the state already are under a uh, obligation, constitutionally even, to deliver um, health service, education service uh, to those places anyway. So as long as those social entrepreneurs can deliver it uh, at a slightly smaller uh, cost expense compared to our uh, very expensive way, but still we have to deliver it, uh, then uh, it, they, they are um, eligible uh, to get the state uh, awards and grants and so on. So uh, this is uh, a very old idea uh, called pay for success uh, that says we should focus on things that government is subsidizing anyway, uh, and then work with entrepreneurs to do it better uh, without forcing them to just enter the market uh, for capitalistic uh, for competition because at those uh, um, the, the early adopter curves uh, there's no sufficiently uh, symmetrical uh, full market mechanism to, to work and many innovations would um, would not have the investment if uh, they couldn't uh, substitute their early return for investment for social return of investment. So we allow many entrepreneurs uh, to get those grants uh, and awards uh, by proving their SROI 
device even without a ROI case. And this is again very important if you are to promote social entrepreneurship and direct technologies to look at civic technology instead of just industrial technology because that's how uh, you can discover the, the truly useful long-lasting application of 5G and maybe later on 6G uh, only the frontline people uh, empowering people closest to the pain can you actually discover the, the use case that makes sense so I hope that answers the question I have to answer very abstractly because I understand the time constraints and also because it's really a seminar level question uh, but if you have follow-ups I'm happy to answer as well yeah thank you very much I think yeah yeah that 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 uh, the idea of inviting a uh, uh, social entrepreneur to to uh, help solving solving issues and of course this go back again to how it will plug in with the, the government to work already and i have a following a follow-up questions on that mm -hmm. um sometimes in thailand we see that uh, um uh the technology or the new innovation when it comes into the scene uh, to the the uh the stage of deployment what uh, many uh, governmental officials uh, are afraid of is that it might fail and then if it fails then it might mean responsibility of um, you know the, the the officials in charge um, but when we think about startup or technology or, or innovation failure is something very common right is mm -hmm. technology innovation mm -hmm. can, can fail so uh, how do you is there any mindset like this in the mm -hmm. public sector in Taiwan mm -hmm. or if that if there is how do you change or how do you encourage people not to fear uh, fear or how to cope with fear yeah well if uh, you deliver a service or product and the market tells you it's not a fit uh, but you're very open about it. You share with your uh, entire ecosystem of the signal in an open way, and you allow those people who point out and complain about those uh, misfits uh, to help designing a, a new iteration that works better. Uh, then it's not called failure in the startup world. It's called a pivot. Right. So basically, uh, what, what we're saying is that we, we need to have this pivoting uh, uh, mentality, this mindset that whatever mm -hmm. we're rolling out is a perpetual beta. And this is the, the trick mm -hmm. of working with the GovZero and many other civic hacker community. If you deliver something that takes ages to build and is perfect, then actually there's no job for the civic tech community to do. Uh, as I often quote uh, Leonard Cohen, uh, um, there is a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in. So if you shift things that has no cracks, that has no failures, uh, there's no way for the citizens uh, to keep engaged because the government is perfect, right? Uh, so what's important uh, here is that don't take it personally. And maybe because uh, I've worked with uh, the Siri team uh, for six years, since 2010 to 2016, uh, I've learned to take nothing uh, seriously. So uh, in many governmental projects, uh, many people, when they first try it out and they found uh, many difficulties and so on, they complain on social media and they blame me and so on. Uh, and, and I don't see them as personal attacks. Uh, I just see it as corpus, uh, right? Uh, that's what we say in computational linguistics, like novel uses of uh, the Mandarin language or the English language. I'm like, oh, wow, this is very innovative, very creative writing. Uh, and then uh, I, I hug the trolls, right? Engage the people uh, on the part that's authentic, that's actually contributing uh, to our understanding uh, of the actual matter. Uh, so for example, one example, very quick, is that when we roll out the mass creation map uh, in 2020, February, uh, although it looks quite good, right? Uh, when, when we sh when I share this map, actually, there's a few pharmacies here that are colored green that's already running out of masks. So the numbers were wrong, and the reason why is that they were collecting people's national health IC cards and handing out numbered cards and telling them to come back in the evening uh, to collect the masks. Uh, so they do it in a batch processing and not really a queuing processing. Uh, and during lunch break, uh, they process the IC cards and update the map. Uh, so uh, in independently, I mean, the map, very useful innovation. Uh, the uh, 
number of cards, um, very good innovation. But together, uh, they're like, I don't know, Coca-Cola and Mentos. <laughs> they explode <laughs> because it results in, in neither uh, being useful uh, to the other. So much so that there's a nearby pharmacy near the place that I live uh, that posted on the front window, very big font saying, don't trust the app, exclamation mark. Uh, and then exclamation mark is one A4 paper, so very large font. Uh, <laughs> so, and when I look at uh, I feel heartbroken, um, but but I, I don't take it personally. I just go back uh, and I just slept uh, for, I think, nine hours or something. Uh, that's what I do when I uh, face anxiety or things like that. So I just sleep. Uh, and then I wake up uh, with a slightly better mindset. And I walk in uh, and I ask about the crack, right? About, okay, so oh, you're handing out those numbers. What would you do? Uh, well, if you're me, if you're the digital minister, what would you do? And they consulted with their fellow pharmacists and they discovered uh, a cybersecurity issue in our mask rationing system. Turns out if you receive uh, like 200 masks in shipment, you enter 200 and your inventory grow uh, by 200. But turn out you can also input negative 10,000, uh, in which okay. case it drops to negative inventory. So it's like white hat hacking. Uh, and then our map doesn't handle uh, the negative numbers. So once you do so, you disappear from the map. It's like a cloaking device. Uh, and of course, uh, when the next day the new shipment comes, uh, you add back uh, this number. So they found a way to hack the system uh, and not uh, be put uh, to the adverse effect of people calling them to say, hey, I see the green light. Why do you say you're out of mask? Are you hoarding a mask and things like that? So I then went back to the National Health uh, insurance administration and told them about this episode and then we work together uh, to create a button that they can just click to cloak for the rest of the day <laughs> and then there there's no uh, bias anymore uh, when they uh, take out uh, the the IC cards and hand out those number plates so uh, I, I, I answer this in quite some details because I think that is the, the spirit uh, we need to have. Uh, this is a, a failure. This in all senses is a failure. Uh, but if I uh, just uh, remain shocked uh, in a kind of shattered glass uh, in my heart when I look at those A4 uh, sized uh, paper, um, then that would be the end of the story. Uh, but because I tell myself that there's a crack in everything and that's how the light gets in, I, I then uh, went in and asked the pharmacies, okay, now be the light. How how would you uh, like us to solve this? So this is empowering people closest to the pain. I think this is something that all the public servants uh, need to be aware that there is at least uh, one or two uh, people who complain the loudest it, uh, precisely because they know the solution and you weren't listening to them. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Yeah, very, very good story of engaging people. And then just because you uh, wish you wish to engage, then there's a way for the solution. Wow. And I think this uh, links to our uh, last topic on the leadership issue. Uh, there are some uh, questions, many questions actually on leadership, uh, which are question number 17, 18, 29 and 30. Uh, so uh, these uh, this question asks about your uh, role as digital minister. Uh, what are the challenges that you you uh, encounter? Of course, you uh, talk a lot about how you solve or how you engage with people. But then, what are the, the challenges that you you had? Uh, maybe also with uh, collaborating with other sectors or other ministers. And how do you imagine your uh, organization will be in the future? And how? you uh, uh, uphold, uphold this uh, spirit of transparency, accountability, what is the important uh, factors over there? And then in general, uh, if you think about the next era, everyone talks about leadership. Um, what is What type of leadership is needed for, for to, uh, the world tomorrow? Yeah, all very good questions. Um, so when I talk about swift and safe, uh, I mm. draw from my own experience when I was a 11-year-old. Uh, uh, I studied in Germany uh, for a year. Uh, and my mom used to uh, drive um, to take our family uh, to a trip on the Autobahn, uh, which is the highway uh, of Germany. And the Autobahn is known for having no speed limit. 
Uh, and uh, paradoxically, my mom told me at least, uh, that the faster you go, the safer you are. Because the fellow <laughs> drivers on the autobahn are also well trained in driving on very high speed. Uh, and so having the firm infrastructure, uh, the German, of course, are very good at construction and highways building and so on, uh, a very good uh, civic infrastructure, a very good automobile um, production uh, and safety standards, uh, also very qualified talents driving uh, those cars. Uh, it ends up in a kind of virtual uh, cycle of people learning to not arbitrarily limiting each other, but uh, encouraging each other uh, to uh, driving at full speed, uh, so to speak. Uh, so that is, I think, the, the most important factor uh, in leadership, in not blocking the freedom of innovation from other sectors of the society just because you cannot keep up with them. Because that's, that's what we do often, right, as regulators. Uh, we tell them don't innovate that quickly because we can't comprehend what you're doing. <laughs> but, but on the other hand, uh, the, the kind of civic participation and accountability like the mask rationing map or the SMS-based contact tracing are precisely the regulatory technologies, the supervising technologies uh, that also taps into the social innovation but for regulatory and supervising purposes. Uh, and so if you can engage the startups, the social entrepreneurs, the same way that those innovators in decentralized finance or whatever are engaging with the startup people, then you are on par with their speed, in which case you don't have to put a speed limit. Uh, on the innovators. You can uh, just cruise uh, on a fixed length uh, right after the leading edge innovators. And sometimes, uh, of course, they uh, break down. <laughs> and then, uh, you learn to uh, you know, draw something that says, please take another route, this doesn't work. <laughs> or, of course, they pave a new road, in which case you, you christen a, a new name uh, to, to the road. Right? And, and so, but regardless, uh, you're not uh, asking them to put a speed limit. So I think that is the most important uh, factor for succeeding, uh, especially uh, when the main call is to use transparency and accountability to serve people's needs when the emerging situation in a pandemic or infodemic and so on are literally changing day by day. There's no way that we can set up a system that works uh, for the foreseeable future. Actually, when it comes to uh, pandemic, it only works until the next Greek letter, right? So <laughs> whenever the next Greek letter comes, we have to do uh, our, our design all over again and, and no uh, well-planned um, um, plans uh, survive that contact with the new Greek letter. We have to actually reside um, in the collective intelligence, the innovation of the public uh, by being agile, as agile as the civic innovators and the private sector innovators. So that's uh, my answer uh, to question 29 and in a sense uh, 16. So uh, I'm not uh, in any particular direction, uh, but I care about the bandwidth of innovation and the latency, the agility of innovation uh, to make sure that all the innovators enjoy universal broadband, that is to say high-speed access uh, to the resources and data they need, and also the short latency from a good idea to its national implementation. That is what I care about. And the values around this are, of course, the sustainable uh, development goals uh, in, in general. Now, the question uh, about the uh, challenges and how to deal with problems at work. Um, as I mentioned, I crowdsource uh, all the solutions, right? So whenever I encounter any challenge, I just went very publicly about it and say that uh, I don't know what to do, help me. <laughs> and then people uh, think of uh, good ideas and, and, and new ideas. And I think that's, that's uh, really important in that we must not have this perfectionism uh, that led us uh, to pretend that we have all the solutions. When, when the new emerging computer virus or biological virus mutations come, we really don't have the solutions. And it's perfectly okay to say, we're still figuring it out, because then the civil society, mm -hmm. the private sector knows how to help you to fix this together. And then you can focus on just making sure the stakeholders, despite their initial different positions, arrive at common values so that the innovations are delivering upon those common values. So I believe that is, uh, again, a kind of meta answer, but that is really how I work. Yeah. 
Wow, fascinating. I think, I think this or uh, uh, your answer already reflected in many stories that you uh, answered to us previously. Um, so we had uh, up until now, we have so many examples that we can uh, that prove that your 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 answer about how to work the way that you work, the way that you crowdsource, or the way that you be very open uh, uh, is the answer to these solutions, uh, the, the solution to this problem. Wow, thank you very much. I think we come to the very last question from uh, the, the, the advanced uh, submitted question. I think we are doing very good on time, so we have some time to do to interaction, direct interaction with our audience. So for those who have questions in mind, please uh, feel free to, to uh, 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 raise your hand or type in your questions. Uh, so the last question is number eight. Uh, who is your role model? And why you regard this person as your role model? This is a little bit more of, of this personal story. We heard your personal story mm -hmm. a little bit about how you become autonomous learner. But yeah, so this might be another uh, question. Mm -hmm. on. Yeah, sure. Well, I am influenced by, by many philosophers, uh, Wittgenstein, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein in particular, uh, but also uh, Lao Tzu, uh, the Taoist uh, original thinker, maybe a, a group of people sharing the same pen name, we don't know. Uh, and my, my dad uh, used to teach me uh, using this method called the Socrates method uh, due to Plato, I believe. Uh, when I was a child, um, I, I could um, like, um, shout and uh, demand all I want, uh, but he would not cave in to my demands until I offer a argument. And once I offer an argument, uh, he never offers any counter argument. He just keeps asking questions. Uh, and then the questions are sometimes very meta, like uh, you make this assumption, but didn't you just say that, that this proves the assumption? Or uh, you said everything is like that, but did you just uh, have a example that proves it's not quite like that? Uh, you said this because of that, but isn't this just uh, a correlation, uh, a time series correlation, not really a causation because of what you just said? Uh, and so on. So basically, he, he would do a lot of, um, I don't know, judo or aikido or whatever uh, <laughs> on, on my arguments, uh, but uh, all the energy come from, from me, uh, from my own argument, from my own words uh, until uh, I can truly uh, take all the sides uh, to think through all the repercussions of any particular argument, not from one particular position, but from all the related uh, positions. And so I think the, the one thing my dad taught me uh, is not to uh, blindly follow any authority, including uh, my dad. <laughs> and so <laughs> I think this is the, the root of the kind of uh, creative thinking that inform my own learning because then uh, I learned to kind of uh, fuse my horizon with the horizon of many different thinkers and writers without taking a side saying, oh, this is my position, I'll just reject other positions. I would instead take all the sides. Uh, so that's the kind of role models uh, since I was very young. Wow, wow. Very fascinating. So we, we see your, your root there <laughs> within your, your answer, that's right? right. Thank you very much. So we have already have some uh, three questions in the chat box. Uh, um, so I'll, I'll just uh, follow the, the order of that questions. But uh, for the audience, if you would like to have a, a direct uh, interaction with Minister, please feel free to raise your hand. We still have and half uh, a half hour uh, left and this is uh, I would say this is a very precious chance that you can ask question directly to minister so uh, maybe we start from the first question I'm not quite sure where is it now I just copy that it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> uh, okay. it was uh, uh, Nirin Tan from uh, uh, Tamasat uh, University asking about uh, could you kindly provide us with information regarding Taiwan's e-government, including mm -hmm. its policies, mm -hmm. governance, legal framework, and policy too. So maybe the, the place mm -hmm. yeah, to I be. Did. I did. Oh, I, I did uh, provide the two links. Ah, okay, already. Oh, yes, yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. That's true. So two links over there mm -hmm. that we can go and uh, get uh, mm -hmm. uh, more information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. And then another uh, question uh, on uh, the common problems between Taiwanese and Thai and uh, what are the common problems that you you, you see uh, uh, and uh, how to solve the problem effectively with digital technology. Mm -hmm. So this one is quite yeah, um, of course, uh, there are worldwide common problems that is the pandemic and the infodemic. 
Uh, but I, I think um, in our cultures, um, a lot of the question that I heard was that we also want to reconcile uh, our culture, which is much more human-centered, uh, much more kind of social relation-centered, uh, uh, with the kind of authoritarian nature of mm -hmm. the uh, emerging technologies such as AI, so-called big data, and, and things like that, that almost naturally uh, let decision-making power become automated and uh, let bias become di more difficult uh, to appeal to as compared to uh, human-assisted uh, decision-making. And also it made uh, things much less transparent uh, to, to many people. So uh, I think this this kind of inherent centralization of data and power that's caused by especially multinational platforms of social media of course that's the most um, most uh, visible example but many other uh, algorithm related examples as well uh, I think it's it's uh, quite heavy on our minds uh, the, uh, based on the question that I heard uh, from the pre-collected uh, questions and so uh, I, I think uh, we really need uh, when we want to say let's deal with it with technology or digital technology uh, the key is really to rethink what technology means um, to me um, science includes social science and technology mm. includes social technology uh, mm. it, it may not be much but actually uh, things like nonviolent communication like open space technology, like dynamic facilitation, the community building skills. And these are technologies too, because they're applied social science that you can teach people. Uh, and so they are technology, but, but it's very, uh, very seldom that we invest in such infrastructures, the way that we invest in industry related infrastructures on the digital realm. So while on the physical realm, we understand we can't just have the entertainment district or business district, we must also have public parks, we must have town halls, campus, and so on invested. This is common sense, everyone could agree. Uh, but uh, on the digital realm, it's very often that we end up not investing in the digital equivalent of those public infrastructure that will let social technologists do their work. And instead, the social workers on the digital uh, realm is forced to go to the digital equivalent of the nightclub, of the entertainment sector on Facebook, um, where everyone is shouting. You have to shout to get heard when uh, there's smoke-filled room, uh, literally addictive drinks being served. Uh, well, not literally, but addictive advertisements being served, uh, private bouncers, and so on. So so in, in many senses, it is a, a nightclub. And don't get me wrong, I have nothing against the entertainment sector, uh, but we should not do our community building work uh, or our town hall deliberations uh, in those districts. Uh, we need the equivalent of that. So uh, I, I believe uh, in Taiwan, um, and I think since last year in the US as well, uh, there's this call to classify the kind of budget on digital infrastructure also as infrastructure. So not just broadband as human rights, but broadband and every public civic service that could be delivered over broadband also as um, the budget money from the public infrastructure money. Um, and so previously, prior to 2015 in Taiwan, um, only concrete buildings uh, for the public goods uh, are eligible for the uh, infrastructure funding. Uh, but now, uh, even those that are not concrete, like not made out of concrete, but made of bits, but serve the same common purposes. Um, it could be that kind of digital model uh, that enable people to plan uh, their urban planning better. Uh, it could be a interactive experience that let people to empathize with more uh, with people with neurodiversity and so on. All those digital curations and creations are now also receiving infrastructure money uh, from our um, office uh, of our um, auditing office classifying into uh, infrastructure because we understand if we don't provide that, people will be forced to choose advertisement supported counterparts, which are not strictly speaking counterparts uh, in those services. So uh, think about technology as social technology and also think about infrastructure in the digital realm and invest in it. I believe these are what we need to do in order to make sure that we still have a functioning uh, relationship with civil society in the digital era. 
Wow, thank you very much. I have a, a following up mm -hmm. uh, question mm -hmm. on uh, the issue that you you mentioned about uh, where to to build our community, like mm -hmm. digital. Uh, yes. What 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 would be the the uh, right platform? Um, one thing that uh, we notice here in Thailand and maybe other uh, countries as well, but in Thailand this is quite uh, 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 how to say uh, this is quite outstanding in a sense that. Um, many communication platforms in Thailand, uh, it is quite diluted to, to the place of um, entertainment or like, you know, the informal, like the more informal, the more people want to engage in. And we end, into, we, we end up in this dilemma that, okay, so we have to, to go to social media platform to communicate for formal work or something that is like really need some more, you know, uh, author, authorized uh, uh, words or authorized order uh, if you pr uh, uh, put that in the governmental platform it might not be heard at all so you have to put it on the social media then all the interaction will be something very informal and then you know rather than using the the formal process of requesting or asking uh, the government then um, social media is better mm -hmm. a way to show out but again you have this problem of like dilemma of um, this might not be the best place to build community mm -hmm. and um and uh, one one observation that we we heard is uh, is because for example Thailand uh, before we digitalized or we because before the digital life came to uh, become very ordinary we didn't use a lot of computer like personal computer we started our digital life with the mobile mobile phone era so people are very familiar with using like you know private uh, devices and kind of like mixing between private and public life or private and work like do you see this as problem or is this some some kind of like transitional uh, uh, period that at the end of the day we know where to put the boundary well i, I think um that the commons the idea of the creative commons uh, may help a lot here because then uh, it decouples uh, the idea of a platform uh, and uh, the communication material or the relationship you want to build, uh, which should be independent of the platform. So, uh, for example, all the conversations with me in the Social Invention Lab, uh, it could be from lobbyists and so on. Actually, this very seminar, I'm recording only my screen, not yours, uh, but uh, your voice as well, uh, into something that I could then later publish uh, on YouTube uh, into the comments. And because it's in the comments, uh, everyone can go through it and remix it however they want. Uh, but because <laughs> it's going to into the comments, so no lobbyist would uh, make a lobby that that's only good for them, but to the expense of everyone else, because it would really uh, look quite bad <laughs> in the comments when people start quoting it, right? So, so radical transparency does have its benefits, and it extends not just to the textual or numeric wax, right? Like my, my portrait photos are also under <laughs> creative comments, and people make a lot of memes uh, out of it. Uh, the, the, as I mentioned, the 3D model of our presidential office is in the comments, uh, our national dictionary is in the comments, and so on. So that enable the people who are good at creating, as you said, a relaxed content to take the governmental materials and then remix it uh, based on their YouTuber channel or whatever in a way that goes the most viral. So it, it become a pro-social relationship with social media creators. And they also understand that we're working off something that's authentic, that is already clarified uh, by the government. And also equally important is to work on the gamification, on the game-like mm. interactive platforms that makes public uh, participation fun. I mean, everyone has two minutes of goodwill. Uh, and so if you can engage them in just those two minutes and say, hey, you can change the, the policy. Uh, in 2015, it was about Uber, uh, about uh, UberX, uh, when somebody don't have a professional driver license, drive to work and back every day, pick up 10 strangers on the road, charging them for it. Uh, how do you feel about it? Now, this is a, a very relaxed way of uh, putting the question by sharing just a simple fact and anecdote 
quote and asking you how would you feel about it.、Uh, people usually have two minutes to share how they feel,、uh, either typing or, or recording.、Uh, but then very quickly, good ideas come. And so、uh, when we look at the Polis platform, which is free software and is、uh, indeed public infrastructure because it's Polis.gov.tw, but you can set up one yourself very quickly.、Uh, it's a survey that is crowdsourced. So on the Uber issue, for example, you may see a fellow citizen saying, "Oh, I think passenger liability insurance is very important." Now, if you agree,、uh, your avatar move closer to me. If you disagree, you move farther away from me. So there's no way to kind of、uh, shout down a voice. All it's measuring、mm-hmm. is the plurality, the different kind of feelings around the same topic, and there's no reply button, so no way for trolls to grow. Because once people start trolling, it's not fun anymore. So it keeps engaging and keeps this funness. So you keep、uh, clicking agree, disagree, agree, disagree, and then、uh, you are also prompted、uh, to share your own feelings about this issue. And before long, because people understand that、uh, the game is convincing people of different clusters, not to. Get two thousand people voting exactly the same way because we were measuring plurality. So two thousand people voting exactly the same way. The group C, for example, may、uh, have an extra zero,、uh, but if the shape doesn't change. And it doesn't change their agenda setting power. It really needs to be convincing all the clusters in order for it to enter our public sector discussion. And so, after three weeks of resonating of this game of interactive consensus building, we always see that just five percent of this ideological statements, like it's a sharing economy, no, it's gig economy.、Uh, well, people don't spend calories on it, but rather people spend time on the ninety percent of the things that people agree with each other on most of the things. Most of the time, with most of their neighbor, and they didn't know it because the mainstream and the more anti-social media amplified the five percent much more than the ninety-five percent, and so. Then we get the sense of the social consensus. We get a sense that people say, "Oh, not undercutting existing meters, empowering local temples and churches with their own fleets, making sure the insurance is covered, and so on."、Uh, well, these are things widely agreed. And then we get a stakeholders live stream of conversation, and Uber and taxi union and so on all are committed、uh, to the same principles, and and we're done. We we literally just、uh, regularized、uh, the the the、uh, legislation. Legislation platform of V Taiwan、uh, on the idea that Uber already committed to those、uh, common consensus that's agreed upon by their own drivers also. <laughs> so they risk losing drivers if they don't say yes, we agree. And so nowadays they are a taxi company, the Q Taxi in Taiwan, and we make sure that the local temple and churches are empowered using surge pricing and so on. So the the point of this story is that at no point. Are you、uh, asked to commit more than two minutes time? But yet,、uh, after many like one more round, one more round of committing two minutes,、uh, people end up spending tons of time on this platform.、Uh, maybe more so than many other social media platforms. And we then, at the end of the day, get a really good signal that is a co-created consensus. Wow. Thank you very much.、Uh, I think this is.、Uh, I, I've heard this story from、uh, the, the similar story from you before. But again,、uh, listening to this, it's just very. Uh, 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 how to say it?、Uh, It makes us realize that that debate can be healthy. Debate can be uh, uh, constructive if we do not amplify the most the ang- the angriest five percent.、Uh, so then we can look at the common things that we hold together.、Mm-hmm. Right. That's right. Hug trolls. Don't amplify them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then、uh, I have one another question from、uh, our audience on、uh, using. Uh, um, on fighting with COVID nineteen, so、uh, so the the audience asks.、Um, so Taiwan is a country with advanced technology, and most people、uh, own smartphones. So as a result, the fast fair fund、uh, Taiwan main strategy to fight with COVID nineteen has been very successful. But in opposite, the, the poor countries lag behind in terms of technology or devices. How would you serve?、Uh, Covid nineteen pandemic under limited technology and internet access. I think this question is very. No, I, I don't think it's about smartphones.、Um, 
I shared、uh, the story of a young boy calling one nine two two. I'm pretty sure he was using a landline,、uh, and uh, the、um, SMS based contact tracing also works with flip phones,、uh, like the ones that doesn't have a clock camera or a touch screen. You can manually text the fifteen digits, and that still counts as a check in. You don't have to scan anything. So the thing is about this gradual. Um, accessibility that whenever people learn a little bit more or is more versed with the using of smartphones, of course they get higher bandwidth access. But even on flip phones, even for people who are still stamping their way in and、uh, dialing landlines,、uh, because we have consulted、uh, the senior people, the elderly people、uh, from day one of the design, so it's always inclusive. You are not forced、uh, to use a, a smartphone、uh, or a advanced uh, machine uh, for that matter. I remember when we introduced the pre-registration of mask in convenience stores. Well, in answer into the OpenStreetMap community,、uh, we、uh, initially wanted to use ATM,、uh, automated teller machines, in convenience stores because everyone has a debit card and it's more popular than smartphones.、Uh, and we want to say, insert your debit card,、uh, transfer uh, just uh, I think、uh, one or two US dollars、uh, to the Center for Disease Control. You have a receipt and you can redeem、uh, medical grade mask. Using that receipt、uh, in a few days and so on, so、uh, we think it's a pretty good system.、Uh, and then I consulted with my own grandma,、uh, my my father's mother,、uh, who is almost ninety years old now,、uh, and she said,、uh, "Well,、uh, she, she she said I don't think this will work." I'm like, "Why?"、Uh, and she said, "Yeah,、uh, she has many younger friends, uh, and uh, so she said,、uh, 'Let me introduce you to my younger friends who will explain to you why this wouldn't work.' Well, her younger friends are almost eighty years old." So only young to to her, I guess.、Uh, and so uh, those uh, elderly uh, people, in particular Grandma Yang,、uh, actually showed me、uh, how she operates、uh, because she doesn't have a smartphone. So whenever she wants to scan something or show something, she has this huge tablet、uh, that doesn't、uh, work outdoors, only in Wi-Fi mode. So anything must work、uh, offline. And her debit card is only used to withdraw money. And never to wire money.、Uh, she said she always go to the counter and write in pen and paper because this is serious business.、Uh, if she types something wrong, she will lose her savings and so on.、Uh, and and I mean, I'm pretty sure that many 77 year olds、uh, think the same way.、Uh, and that's the reality. We can't deny the reality. And so when when she said, yeah, so if you insist on using ATM, I'll go back to pharmacy and queue for three hours and curse the government.、Uh, I tend to believe her. <laughs> and so again, I. Ask the same question. Okay, so if you're the minister, what would you do? And and she's like, is there a way to convert this kiosk to accept my health card so that I can treat it like an automated pharmacist machine? <laughs> so there's no money exchange involved. I can pay in coins over the counter. I can count exactly fifty-two、uh, Taiwan dollars, around two U.S. dollars, and I don't have to worry about my saving being gone because somebody over the shoulder have looked at my PIN code.、Uh, Because the ID card doesn't have a pin code that needs to be entered in pharmacies, I'm like, I've never thought about this way. But if you put it like this, there's nothing technically blocking it. <laughs> so we work with more than twelve thousand convenience stores to ensure that their card reader firmware and everything are upgraded,、uh, and then and then it's done.、Uh, people started pre-ordering、uh, medical grade masks、uh, using health cards、uh, without having to enter a pin code,、uh, and they get to pay in cash if they so want. And then、uh, Grandma Young was was was、uh, delighted. I mean, she convinced everyone、uh, younger than her, maybe sixty six years old, in the community because she's a key opinion leader and she's a co-inventor of this government <laughs> mechanism and so on.、Uh, and and then we don't have to worry about convincing the elderly or people who don't use the smartphone because、uh, obviously we've taken their、um, wisdom、uh, to account. But if you don't include these people on day one, then of course they complain and then uh, maybe uh, they will show、um, anxiety and fear and uncertainty. And then、uh, before long,、uh, the members of parliament, the city councillors, starting to cancel your budget because you left the elderly behind, right? So it always pays to consult the elderly, but not. Just to ask, well, if you feel good or bad, but ask if you're the minister, what would you do? Thank you very much for a very nice uh, uh, story. Uh, I think there's one uh, 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 audience who would like to ask question directly. Is that correct? Could none one? So、uh, 
for those who would like to ask question directly, could you please uh, raise your hand or maybe just turn on your microphone? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, unmute yourself. The most important thing in democracies. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I'm not quite sure if uh, Dr. Shi Liang Li, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly, from University of Malaya. Uh, do you want to uh, uh, ask question directly? Hello. I have heard someone. Hi. I see you unmute yourself. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah, we, we can't quite hear um, you. You're, you're breaking out a lot. It might be the internet connection. Yeah, it might be the human rights situation. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Dr. Lee. I think we, we hear you, but it's not very clear. Uh, hello. Yeah, you, you can you can maybe type your oh, questions. Uh, yeah, maybe type. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. See. <laughs> okay, so maybe we, we wait for uh, Doctor Lee to to type and uh, his question on the on the chat Audrey. box. Mm -hmm. It might be related to the. Yes. Ah uh, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, I have a problem with my video. Uh -huh, yes, much better. Yeah. Okay. So I mm -hmm. think maybe we we wait for the for the question in chat box if uh, uh, if Doctor Lee is uh, typing. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. I. Uh, May I use my privilege as a moderator to ask you another question sure, sure, <laughs> before of course, we? Of course, go ahead. Yeah, I will. Uh -huh. Yeah, because uh, you talk a lot about uh, inter intergenerational solidarity, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that is also a problem in many uh, countries as well. And in Thailand, we do have this uh, uh, issue of different generations seem to understand each other become very harder to understand each other and there are many values that uh, they held they, they hold differently so uh, do you have any uh, idea of how to create this intergenerational uh, solidarity you share with us uh, the, the the system of mm -hmm. reverse inter yes. or, or mm -hmm. entering mm -hmm. um or is there any other things that we can introduce or we can encourage this international intergenerational understanding or uh, uh solidarity yeah definitely um in our uh, e-petition platform uh <clears throat> join platform a lot of the petitioners uh were people uh younger than 18 probably because that's the only way they can affect uh, the policies uh, instead of going to vote. They don't have right to vote yet. But the 16 years old and 17 years old, while being very active, uh, are uh, only as active as the 70 and uh, 60 years old. So these two uh, age brackets are the most active ones mm -hmm. on the joint platform. Uh, compared to their usual internet usage, of course. Uh, but the, the reason why is that they tend to care more about long-term effects, more about sustainability, more about the next generation. Uh, on one hand, the 17-year-old is literally the next generation, uh, right? So, uh, and uh, unlike people who are still in a business and so on, who tend to worry about their own sector, uh, they take uh, naturally a more multi-sectoral way because they don't identify so strongly with any particular sector. And maybe for the 60 years old or 70 years old, they have multiple sectoral experiences already uh, in their lives. So uh, the point here is that uh, we need uh, to create spaces such as this so that they can discover each other uh, just like how people raising their hands do not uh, know when they're raising their hands whether the question is shared by the everyone else or just a minority or a majority in the audience. Systems such as polis or join and so on let us see each other as kind of pseudonyms uh, and only focusing on the values that we care and without trolls. 
Now, once these are set up, then we have, for example, a petitioner a couple years ago names uh, I love elephants and elephants love me, uh, petitioning uh, that we ban plastic straws on our national uh, drink, the bubble tea takeouts, uh, and gradually from all the takeouts, uh, and gradually ban plastic straws altogether. Uh, now, uh, that went viral. Uh, I think it's because of a picture of a sea turtle choked by a plastic straw. Uh, but anyway, it went viral. Uh, but many people who joined uh, are uh, of a more senior age, uh, and they spent a lot of time campaigning uh, for environmental actions, and they saw this brilliant idea with this really good uh, viral picture, and they just associated uh, themselves on it. But when we uh, finally met the petitioner, well, she was just turning 17. Uh, and when we ask her why would you like to uh, start this conversation uh, with the Environmental Protection Administration, uh, she's like, well, it's our civics class assignment. So there you have it. Uh, we have in high schools a uh, civics class assignment that encourages young people to start nationwide petition that take care of things that the elderly people care about. <laughs> and so that's kind of a natural incentive to our intergenerational solidarity. And of course, uh, we would end up implementing her suggestions and she would end up becoming at 19 years old uh, Commissioner Wang of the National uh, Action Plan Committee for Open Government. Uh, so it all checks out, I believe. I see. Wow. Thank you very much again for such an inspirational uh, story. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have uh, quite a long list of questions uh, from Dr. Lee. Oh, wow. uh, and oh. um, maybe I'm not quite sure if we oh, have. Maybe. Yes. yes, yes, please, Lee. I think oh, you're... Yeah, perhaps I just. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, just. Uh, those are my questions uh, for the session earlier. Yeah, yeah. So actually, just uh, one to ask. Uh, uh, if if, if, uh, if I because I'm. Um, yeah, maybe maybe just just write me okay uh, I, I think yeah. this is easier uh, and and I'm just uh, going to share my work email uh, and uh, or, or Twitter. Uh, uh, feel free to reach on to about the well. CBI yeah. yeah I think we, we will do it in the future thank you very yeah, much I, I, think, uh, I, th I think that's a, a better use of a of our time at this uh, particular moment, oh, uh, sure, and I can sure. also uh, refer you to yeah, the civil you. IoT thank colleagues you. who can answer more like technical detail questions. Yeah, thank you very much, and uh, yeah, sure. I think thank you very much, uh, Minister, for your time and mm -hmm. also your uh, insightful uh, stories. And I think we learned okay. a lot today, and maybe uh, we can have more uh, exchange and collaboration in the future. Thank you very much for the organizer. Thank you very much for the audience who participate and ask a lot of questions. Yeah. And thank you very much. Uh, we hope we can welcome you in the future and uh, person in Thailand oh, yeah, next definitely. time. I've got my booster shop. I can travel anywhere. And I learned that uh, <laughs> you relaxed uh, the, the quarantine measures uh, freshly uh, for, for people like me. So I am uh, really okay, looking you. forward to meet you in person. Uh, and until then, live long and prosper. Bye.